go back to the, their April release, they were pretty certain this thing would be in the air uh, momentarily. I don't know how they got that. They were dreaming. I do not know how they got that. Now, you have to believe that it was Dennis that was telling everybody it was going to be fine. I mean, there was even at the end when they made the projection for 2020, you, know, you, you would speak to them and say, listen, don't worry, don't worry. And, you know, everyone was worried except for, except for Dennis. So we do we think the dividend question has been answered, or does that change now with this news? Uh, well, I think that the look, they got to get this thing in the air. The cash flow is the, the cash flow wasn't bad in the last quarter, but that wasn't really emblematic. I think that, I think they look. I want to hear what Calhoun says, and I want to hear what, what someone someone who does not have anything to do with what occurred, because I think we all know that the cash flow is not a, a, a really prudent person would not necessarily let that dividend stay at this level. Jim, stay right there. Uh, let's bring in Phil LeBeau. Uh, Phil, we're all, I'm at least reminded of your interview with Muhlenberg in the Hill, halls of Congress uh, just prior to his testimony. And uh, although he wasn't expecting to take questions at the time, you did ask him about his tenure. Did you ever see this coming? Uh, I was not surprised when I heard the news this morning when my producer, uh, I'm on vacation like Jim, and my producer called me. She said, news pending, and I said, I bet you it's Dennis not being a CEO anymore. I do have a little bit of color from talking with some folks uh, at Boeing. This was a decision of the board. This was not Dennis Mullenberg saying, look, things are rough, and I'm maybe not the right person to lead this. He was fired. This was the board saying, enough. We have got to move in a new direction. They deliberated over the weekend before they reached the decision uh, last night. Uh, there was a, a phone call that the board held uh, to reach that consensus uh, last night when they decided that they were going to go in a different uh, direction with David Calhoun uh, coming in as president and CEO starting effective January 1st. I know there are some people who are going to say, well, why doesn't you just start right now? Um, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. Um, it's not like three weeks are going to kill anybody, uh, but at the same time, this is a company that's in crisis. So that's one of the questions that will be asked, along with the dividend question. Um, we are not expecting to hear from David Calhoun or from Greg Smith or any of the other uh, Boeing executives or board members today. My sense is that that's going to be happening in relatively short order, though, in some fashion. And I know we hear from David Calhoun uh, in the uh, release from the company. But the, to answer your, your first question, Carl, I was not surprised. Um, this was increasingly a company where they were not managing this crisis. The crisis was managing them. And at some point, the accountability has to go to the CEO. And I know there will be some people who say this is way too long in coming, should have happened sooner. Uh, but this was a, a, a crisis that was poorly handled, poorly managed from the beginning. And ultimately, uh, Dennis Mullenberg has to take the ball for that. Uh, Phil, it's David. Um, tell us a bit about Calhoun. You obviously uh, conducted a long interview with him uh, not that long ago. You know, I've been hearing, and I know you are much closer to it as well, that he's certainly been very much hands-on uh, as the company's chairman. Uh, what can we expect here in terms of his leadership? He's taking over January 13th, uh, and obviously it's not an interim designation. He is going to be the company's uh, CEO and president. I would say the biggest thing that you will notice, and his influence is already seen in the decision that was made after uh, Dennis Mullenberg met with the head of the FAA last week, where they withdrew any kind of a timeline for getting the MAX back in the air, that's going to be the influence of David Calhoun. I, I think he has watched this, and he has said, no, 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 you cannot, you cannot continually say we're going to have it up by this date. We're getting there. We're making steady progress. Uh, I think his approach is going to be get it fixed, get it right, and when it's ready, then we go. Until then, nothing is served by continually giving the streets, uh, your customers, the airlines, this sense that, uh, hey, the plane is going to be fine. And remember, guys, you know, you will hear airlines set these dates and they continue to move them back. Some of that is based on discussions with Boeing. The other part of that is they have continually moved these back. Uh, and two-month, three-month increments because they have got to set their pilot schedules. And you just can't go open-ended. You just can't say, well, I'm never, we don't know what the schedule is going to be for this plane. So you've got to set that schedule two or three months down the road. Um, I, I suspect that that, to an extent, will continue until we get some definitive word from David Calhoun and the rest of the leadership at Boeing. This is what we're going to do. And by the way, Stan Deal, who now runs commercial airplanes and has... Uh, for some time since Kevin McAllister was fired, 
he's in lockstep with Calhoun in terms of style and approach. Very much a detail-oriented, I'm not here for the conversations or for the public statements. I'm here to get this done. Uh, so I think they'll work well together. Hey, Phil, I, got one. I want to get to Jim, because uh, as the stock has now resumed trading up almost 2% here. But one question for you, Phil. Do you have an answer as to why they seem to overpromise repeatedly the return to service? Do we know in, internally what they're thinking? Did they honestly believe this? Were they trying to cover for something else? Uh, because we've talked so long about the value of uh, obviously un over uh, under promising and over delivering. I think they were overconfident in their ability uh, as engineers to engineer their way out of this problem. And one of the things that I'm reminded of, Carl, is very early on, there was a briefing out in Renton of here is the problem, um, and we're going to explain to you what we're doing, but we don't want the cameras rolling during the explanation. A little odd, but all the reporters who were there, we accepted it. You, you, you had to accept it, and immediately questions started coming. Look, I'm not an aerospace engineer, but I was asking questions, as were other reporters, that were basic questions, and it was clear. They were like, well, we'll get an answer for that, and we think we know what we're doing, and it, it, that was the very first instance where you sat there and you said, no, 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 you, you, you can't just engineer your way out of this. You have got to handle some of the most basic questions on this. And I think that gets to the broader issue is the culture at Boeing Commercial Airplane. Great company, great engineers, but in this case, they over or they, they relied too much on their belief that their engineering could work their way out of this problem. Jim, how about the price action here? 336. Well, I, I think that it makes sense. That it felt so right. I mean, anybody who was trying to follow this period, you never knew. They were always one step up. They were always one step behind the posse. You never, ever, you'd pick up the paper, and, and there there would be something. And, and you'd call me and say, well, guys, you need this. Why didn't you tell me? You need this. Why didn't you tell me? And no matter what you did, they just did never, they never seemed to know the news flow. They were very unprofessional about it. And the only thing I can say is that I would, you know, the stock is actually worth more without Dennis than with, if only just because maybe the headline surprise factor is over. This could be, it's, look, it's a crisis, but there is crisis management that could be done. There are professionals who know how to handle crises, particularly with journalism, but also with the analysts, and these guys didn't have it. And it was really unbelievable. Like, you would, like, you wake up, you say, hey, guys, why didn't you tell me this? Why didn't you tell me the Times was going to do this? Why didn't you tell me the journal? Why didn't you tell me this? Why didn't you tell me that? They had no control of this. And it was just, it, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. Hey, uh, Phil, you're still there, right? It's David. Um, <laughs> We've uh, the only feedback I'm getting thus far in terms of why the little bit of a of a gap between now and the 13th. Apparently, Calhoun has some other non Boeing related commitments he needs to uh, fulfill and make sure he sort of squares away before he takes over as full time, of course, as the company's uh, CEO uh, and president. But Phil, you know, I, there also is this sense that I've certainly been hearing, and I know you have as well, that you know Mullenberg has been focused on the return to service. The suspension, obviously, from last week was a big deal and something he'd been focused on, but the board sort of felt like, okay, he's dealt with that, and Calhoun's feedback from customers and regulators was he cannot continue uh, as the CEO. I assume you sort of heard similar. Yeah, yeah, and and this feeds into what, and I know you and I and, and, and Jim and I and Carl, we've discussed this before, whether or not there is a residual impact of the max prices. You bet there is. Take a look at what's happened with the 777X. Take a look at what's happened with the newest plane that has been essentially shelved for a while, what they call the middle-of-the-market airplane. They were supposed to introduce it in Paris. They didn't, obviously, because they were focused on the max. What happened? Airbus comes out with the A321 XLR. They start racking up orders. Not just little orders, substantial orders. The most recent of note being three weeks ago when United Airlines says, we want that airplane. We want 50 of the A321 XLR. Boeing's middle of the market airplane remains on the drawing board. And who knows if we'll see it by the time that the Farnborough Air Show comes up in, in July. But one thing is clear. They were not in the process of saying, what's, the, what's on the horizon? 
They are one step behind the competition right now. And that is something that is completely unacceptable in Boeing's world. Completely unacceptable. And I think the board finally said, we have got to, this, it is time to move forward and become much more aggressive in terms of our planning, working our way out of this crisis, working our way back into a better standing with our customers. Jim Stewart, I wonder if you think uh, there'll be a revisitation of discussion of Muhlenberg's comp? Are we going to be looking at renewed calls for clawbacks? Well, there, there certainly should be. I mean, after a performance like this. I was also want to say something Jim Cramer mentioned that, um, you know, these crises are not a new thing. It's not like Boeing really had to reinvent the wheel here. I mean, the facts, specific facts may be new, but this kind of problem, there are experts, many people have dealt with it. And I've been sort of stunned all along the way that the model they seem to have followed was the Wells Fargo model. Again, a great company, a great brand name. It had the Warren Buffett stamp on it. Everybody thought this is like the state-of-the-art banking thing. And suddenly, I mean, after a horrible performance in front of Congress and after, you know, revealing, you know, all the customer problems, it dawned on people that the culture had significantly changed without anyone realizing it and that the rot had really spread from the top way, way down. Now, I hope that is not the case here. I think Boeing is a great company, has a great history, engineering prowess that is, you know, pride of the United States all these years. But again, I have to wonder, what are we going to find out now? I mean, the, maybe it's not just this one software thing. Again, this delays in the new plane implementing, but there is a in the background of all this has been this disturbing idea, to me anyway, that they were managing Boeing like any other company. Like, how can we squeeze more profitable? How can we speed this stuff up? How can we ca cut costs? But Boeing is a unique company. It is a consumer-facing company. It's an industry-facing company. It's a public regulatory issues. People's lives are at stake every time one of those things takes off. It can't be about profit first. It has got to be about quality first. Not to first. mention it's part of a duopoly where you'd think the pressures are not as great on it because it's not going to lose market share conceivably, or not certainly over any short period of time. Right, and, I mean... And yet that was a surprise, I think, for That's, many. again, that's ex extraordinary that they should be taking the long-term view. It is right. a duopoly. They can afford to let the profit margins go down a little bit in the long-term interests of shareholders and the, and the health of the company. And I don't... I just am astonished that they lost that sort of fundamental outlook under Muhlenberg. Well, J Jim Kramer, uh, if, if Jim Stewart is right and some new facts get shaken loose by Muhlenberg's exit... I wonder if you think there will be longer-term implications on the order book, or at least on pricing. I think there will be. I look, Boeing's going to survive. It's a great company. But and Jim's right. I mean, one of the things that, and I know Phil can talk about this too, but one of the things that kept happening, you pick up the paper and there would be a very high-level engineer who would have sent something to Mullenberg saying, look, we cannot cut costs like this. We cannot do this. We're gonna... And then you would call Boeing and Boeing would be like, don't worry about it. Be like, then there'd be another one like, you know what, we have been trying to cut back and say, I don't want to work here anymore. I've been, and you, you kept the other don't worry about it. I mean, I have never been told don't worry about it more in my life than from Bowen. And i got to tell you, I am really worried about it. Because these guys are masters at telling you don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. Phil, I know you have to leave uh, in just a couple of moments here, but I don't know. Do you want to put a coat on this and tell us what we should be looking for in the weeks ahead? I bet you you have a relatively quiet week or two here from uh, David Calhoun. Doesn't mean he's not engaged. He clearly is engaged. Uh, he'll be even more engaged. But in terms of a public um, statement, I think that uh, he, at some point, maybe early January, will say, okay, let me, let me give you some sense of where we are going. We will not get a timeline from him when he sits and talks with us, or me, or other reporters, uh, but you will see a definitive shift, a definitive shift in how Boeing approaches not only this crisis, but how the company is going to be operated going forward. It'll be much more uh, clear that there is going to be accountability, that there is going to be um, a much greater rigor, if that makes sense, when it comes to not only engineering, uh, but decisions, working with customers, etc. Our Phil Lebeau, whose vacation I think might be a little bit short uh, this morning. Phil, I think we'll see you later on today. Uh, thank you. You will. Phil Lebeau, I think Jim's going to stick around for a few moments here as we get closer to the opening bell. Uh, more broadly, Jim, does is this a signal that we should be on the lookout for some tape bombs in this uh, holiday-shortened week? 
Jeez, I gotta say it. It's just certainly, well, let's put it this way. It can't be possibly as bad as last year. When we had the pal bear market, which was centered, which was centered around my five days in Costa Rica. It won't be like that. It can't no. possibly be as bad as last year. Uh, this news actually is probably going to be welcomed by a lot of people who've been buying Bowling stock. I think knowing that there was going to be a change. I think we just didn't know the time frame. And you, what's funny is someone, just like what Phil Lebron said, someone who just says, okay, well, whatever we were doing here, we have to have an actual investigation internally about what went on. And a lot of us were shocked that they probably never said, all right, full we'll stop, let's find out what happened, shut down everything. It's going to cost us, I don't know, $5 billion. And if we have to, we will spend the dividends. But we are not going to sacrifice anything. Uh, there's no sacrifice to safety. We're tired of hearing that we are taking shortcuts. Because that's what I think people felt they were doing. They never did the full stop shutdown. They never hired the price managers. They never gave us any sense about what was going to happen. Well, they didn't know what was going to happen. And that's right about that. Jim, our thanks to you. Uh, Jim Kramer, if you missed the news about half an hour ago, uh, Dennis Mullenberg of Boeing is out. David Calhoun is CEO and president, effective January 13th. And Mullenberg's exit is effective immediately as the fallout from the 737 MAX continues. There's the opening bell and the S&P 500 at the CNBC Real-Time Exchange at the big board. It's the New York chapter of the National Children's Chorus. You might have heard them singing in the background as we were talking some Boeing at the NASDAQ, the National Women's Hockey League. Well, David, on Monday morning, got started with a bang. Yes, oh. yes, we got uh, we got some significant news. And again, as I think Phil and Jim and I had indicated, it's not a surprise. The timing really was the only question many of us had in terms of when Mr. Mullenberg would exit Boeing, not necessarily uh, whether or not it would happen. Um, it is termed a resignation, but it, obviously he was dismissed, as Phil said, and as I can tell you as well by the board and a decision they reached last night, although one that they had cer certainly been moving towards for quite some time, it would appear. And in part, the timing, I'm told at least, was due to the fact that they feel as though Mullenberg's sort of checklist of things in terms of the dealing with the return to service uh, as his focus and the suspension of, uh, of manufacturing of the airplane, those were kind of the key things that he had been dealing with. They have been dealt with, at least to some extent, uh, and Mr. Calhoun's discussions with regulators and customers made it clear to the board, at least, and remember, he was the chairman um, of that board, that Mullenberg had to go. So he's gone. Calhoun is in. You heard Phil discussing what we can expect from him when he takes over January 13th, uh, and Boeing shares are, uh, are starting the day higher. You know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the chairman divided CEO role that was taken away from him. I mean, this was, I think, healthy for the company because suddenly you have an independent chairman, you have an independent information flow. When there's a combined CEO and chairman, you don't have that. The same person is hearing from everyone, which is why, frankly, a lot of CEOs do not want to give up the chairman job. This is a case study why you have it. Right. That's a great point, I think, as well. It wasn't that long ago that that was the case, of course, and Calhoun was, as you say, Jim, another sort of set of eyes and ears and very much focused. And in recent weeks, I've been told, also really involved in the nuts and bolts of the company uh, beyond what you typically see for a chairman. Would it surprise you if, if, if we're ass assessing this as a clean slate, right? Calhoun has a tabula rasa to come back in. Would you expect further delays to return to service, maybe a second half story? Would that surprise you? Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, I think, again, he's got to shift to this. We've got to start beating expectations as opposed to disappointing them. If it was me, I would want some breathing room. I would want the time. And most of all, to make sure that we really do this right, that Boeing does it right. And then there, I would say no more additional delays. Once I say it's going to happen, it's got to happen. Uh, a lot of that's contingent on regulators and so forth. Uh, right, and, so yeah. make sure they're on board with whatever you're going to say. Again, it's, it sounds like the regulators were surprised and shocked by some of the things that Eulenberg said. That should never happen. He shouldn't have said a word without the regulators already knowing what he was going to say. 
Uh, Boeing, of course, uh, given the price action now is adding about 70 points. Uh, it's the t top performing Dow component on this uh, morning, followed by 3M, which, as we get to some other stories here, does get up to uh, at JP Morgan to neutral. Uh, they go 143 to 150, one of those names that uh, has disappointed pretty much all year long amid pressures on global trade. But I wonder if you feel like 2020 is going to feel different from a trade standpoint. Well, um, hey, look, we're getting promising signs out of China. That's been, that's been the big news in, in the past year. And China, of the, all the trading partners we're dealing with, is the biggest one. That's why I'm cautiously optimistic about that. The problem now is expectations have shifted so much that there is risk of, of down surprise, a big surprise on the downside. Meanwhile, we've got some kind of trade war going on with Latin America. I don't know how significant that is going to be. And I think people didn't pay much attention, but just a couple weeks ago, the U.S. threatened to drastically lift tariffs on Europe again, moving like to 100% on a lot of these products. I mean, Trump on the one hand is saying, oh, he wants this glorious free trade deal with Boris Johnson. And, but at the same time, we're saying, no, no, we're going to like ratchet up all these things, especially France, UK, the, the, again, talking about Airbus, uh, that's part related to that. But, you know, we're getting some more friction in the Europe area. So I'm not at all confident that uh, at least for the first half of the year, these trade things are going to go away. Losers this morning at the at the open, at least, are centered around media uh, as Disney's but Rise of Skywalker is the lowest grossing open uh, among the last three Star Wars films, 20% down from Last Jedi, uh, on a day where we, we learned that 34% of total box office, 39 maybe, is the top 10 films. Like, it's becoming the fang, as someone said, of the box office. Right? Well, one thing that worries me, having written about Disney over many years and also watched the entertainment industry for so many years, is that, you know, everybody thinks Disney has the silver bullet, which is the big tentpole, high-budget franchise film, and it has worked fantastically well for them. But I can remember other cycles where people thought they had the silver bullet. There was the Eisner area with the famous singles and doubles, you know, Beverly Hills Cops and all of that. That was the formula. They had like 19 profitable movies in a row. And people said, okay, they've, they've solved the mystery. They've got it all down. It just makes me nervous that none of these formulas last forever. And a lot of this intellectual property, let's face it, it is... It's aging. I mean, how many Star Wars things can you squeeze out of this? I mean, a lot. I don't mean to take away from it. I mean, it still made a lot of money, but I think that's what investors are getting nervous about. Um, yeah, it's worth noting Netflix is also down this morning. Again, neither one is down a great deal. I mean, though, Disney does have so many of those tentpole franchises, Jim. It's oh, not just a Star Wars. Year. I mean, Marvel's going to have endless, they have endless stories to mine there and they've obviously had the highest grossing films of all time amongst any number of their new entrants or entrants in the last year or two um, and Disney Plus it's hard to find somebody who doesn't think that it's going to be and hasn't already become a success given the numbers that they've gotten early on yeah I agree with that I think that what remains to be seen is where are the where are the profit margins going to settle in this streaming universe I mean you look at Netflix and you know you don't see you don't see the um, you know the pot of gold at the end of that particular rainbow yet I mean in theory there's going to be a finite number of these and they'll have enough market power they can begin to raise prices and come up with some you know pretty good margins but is it ever going to replicate the cable model oh my god that I mean that that thing those margins were so phenomenally great I don't think anyone thinks so and I, that's not to criticize Disney for making the move because the cable model is not going to last no it's not now and that same, was a domestic model and I, you know when I talk to the likes of John Malone about that he'll admit as as we all know that was a unique thing for 2020 25 years right. where you basically have people paying for you and not actually watching and you're also benefiting from advertising. However, the only offset to that is the global scale that you can conceivably have with streaming that you didn't have, obviously, in the domestic cable distribution model that we all live with for so long. Yeah, and mean, Netflix, we all know, is all about foreign subscriptions. It's no longer about their domestic growth. The question is whether Disney's going to actually hurt market share for them here, but it's not about whether or not they're going to grow significantly domestically any longer. Right. I mean, I, I do think if you're a long-term investor, you bet on this. 
that it's going to take time the way Amazon has taken time, but there will someday be a world of a finite number of streaming programmers. The barriers to entry are going to be quite high. Once you've got these things and you're used to going on to them, however many, it's going to be five, six, you know, I don't know what it will be. Well, that's the key. We don't know how many. We don't know know yet. But then, then, you know, then you've got, you know, a finite number of providers here and they can start raising prices a little bit, seeing the price sensitivity, and the margins could get up there to be fairly healthy. Yeah. But you've got to take a long-term view. I mean, people seem to be giving Netflix a benefit of the doubt, and I think Disney has has been really smart to start trying to get that multiple on, on their stock. But let's face it, it's going to take a long time before we know the answers. Without a doubt. And Iger will no longer be the CEO when those answers start to come in. No, he, can go out on his, he can go out on his whiteboard. Yes, he will. Jim, we're just going to hop from story to story that you've covered because Tesla, fresh all-time high this morning. I think uh, 416, 415. As uh, Reuters says that they um, are getting a loan from some Chinese banks, about $1.4 billion to finance their Shanghai factory. I wonder what you think of the turn this stock has done in the last sec- well, six it's, months. It's phenomenal. I, I mean, first of all, I'm happy about it because I think that Tesla is a great product and it's, it's beautiful, it's innovative, its quality seems to be extraordinarily high. But what we had for a period were these antics, if that's what you want to call of it, of the chief executive. And again, again, we're talking about splitting the CEO chairman. They got a, a separate chairman, and I don't know if this is the answer, but somebody has kept Elon Musk off the front pages for his behavior and on the front pages for the achievements of the company. He's back on his game. He hasn't been sending out crazy tweets. Uh, there haven't been you know, ridiculous stories about his personal life. I don't know what accounts for it, but it's healthy. I mean, again, I just hope it can continue. You, were, when you wrote, you, you sort of were right in there when he seemed to be a man on the edge he when was, you were doing a lot of your reporting. And I he believe kinda, he was a man on the edge. He got kind of pulled back. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what it took, and good for him because sometimes those things are, can be personally very challenging. And he was in a situation where nobody ever said anything he didn't want to hear. And yet, the company, and he in particular, seem to be going off the rails. I think that was what's so frightening about it. And again, it's not an aircraft company, but a car, too, is something, your safety is at stake in there. You You don't want to feel that some crazy person is running the operation. You want somebody, not necessarily sober, I love his flair, he's got a great sense of theatricality, he tells a great story. Those are all strengths. But to couple that with behavior that just left everybody kind of scratching their heads and worrying that he was losing control, that that was terrible for the company. It affects consumer attitudes. But good for him. I think it has stabilized. He's come up with some great sales numbers. Product quality has been very, very high. And it, I mean, the stock, when last time I looked, has just been, if you bought it at that bottom, Those lows. I mean, oh my yeah. God. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's almost approximating now the, the returns of the S&P over the course of the year, and there was a point at which it was down so sharply. Uh, he still can't keep a general counsel, though, for whatever reason. <laughs> that that has well, been beyond his abilities. Stability in the management ranks would also be yeah. a big plus yes. there. We'll, yes. we'll see. I don't, I, he's, he's never been an easy person to work for, and I'm not sure that's going to change anytime <laughs> soon. Um, We're joined uh, for some more color this morning uh, on Boeing by Leslie Josephs, uh, our CNBC airline reporter. Uh, Leslie, what what do you think we can add to the story we already know? Well, I think a big question is kind of what took so long, because Mullenberg has been under pressure for a very long time. The question was, when are you going to resign? When are you going to resign? And I think now we finally have our answer. Uh, He's been under fire from airline executives whose compensation from this crisis is growing every day and now seems going to, it's going to continue into uh, well into 2020, possibly into next summer. Um, the, The victims of the families, I was just down in Washington a few weeks ago, they have wanted him out for a really long time. And it's a question of how does Boeing best regain trust of the actual public who's going to be flying these planes. Do we have a read yet as how as to how they're going to market it? Would you be surprised if uh, there's a name change of the model or, I don't know, anything that the market has not really started to price in? Uh, I mean, that's been talked about before. I, it's not even clear what they're going to go through with because they don't even have the FAA's approval yet. Even if they do that, it's going to be Boeing's best-selling aircraft. It's not really something that you can hide with a name change. The plane is going to be coming back. And airlines are going to be very transparent, as they told us, uh, with passengers that this is the plane. So even if you were to change those three little letters, the MAX, uh, people are going to know what, what they're flying. Any idea about Calhoun and what we can expect from him? 
Um, well, he has some aircraft experience before. I mean, he's a, a former GE executive on the aviation side. He has plenty of experience with crises before. Um, so the market should probably like this because this is someone who's essentially being sent in to clean up a mess. Yeah, long time Blackstone as well. Work yes. closely with uh, Steve Schwartzman over there, we should add as well. I know Schwartzman's got a lot of good things to say about Calhoun. Yeah, I think he's got a good resume. I think the, one of the reasons the stock is up probably is that investors are going to be happy with that. He's got enough of the technical expertise. He's got a very sophisticated financial background. But I think what will be most important to him is being able to communicate, being able to kind of sell the idea that quality is our most important thing and we're going to do everything we can to make sure we adhere to that. Really quickly, uh Calhoun spoke to Squawk Box back in November about this very issue. I want to listen to that piece of tape and then ask Leslie something really quick. From the vantage point of our board, Dennis has done everything right. Um, from the beginning, from the beginning, remember Dennis didn't, didn't create this problem, but from the beginning, um, he knew that MCAS should and could be done better. And he has led a program to rewrite MCAS to alleviate all of those conditions that uh, ultimately uh, beset two unfortunate crews and the families and victims. All right, so I guess, uh, Leslie, impact on suppliers? Uh, how closely are you watching that? And if this is delayed even further, I wonder uh, how much damage, uh, what their strategy is, whether or not there's a story out today about GE trying to make some headway on the Airbus front if, in fact, they're going to be facing longer delays on the Boeing side. Yeah, GE has that advantage in that it, it is a, a supplier also to Airbus. Uh, we've already seen a fallout from suppliers. Uh, Spirit Aerosystems, which makes the fuselages for the 737, had long continued to make these uh, the fuselages even though the Boeing had halted deliveries and the, and the planes were actually piling up at its facilities, but now they're going to have to do something similar. Uh, so there's going to be an impact pretty much throughout the entire economy. The bigger impact is also on some of the smaller suppliers. Maybe they don't have the same uh, cash cushion that a, a big supplier like Spirit has. So as you go further and further down the chain, that's when that's you see a, a bit more uh, pain. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, there's no accident that President Trump actually called Muhlenberg last week to talk about this shutdown and what it meant. I mean, it, the, the fact that this problem penetrated the Oval Office, I think, is a measure of how significant it is to the broad economy and the threat that a prolonged shutdown would pose for it. Oh, yeah, and uh, the Times piece again, referencing that this morning, talks about the call, the reassurance that Muhlenberg gave to the president in the early innings of this whole saga, that it was going to be fine and, and not last long. Yeah, I don't care what he told him. It's never a good sign when the president calls you after you've had to announce bad news like that. I mean, that is not a positive. Um, so we'll see how the gains uh, are sustained here today regarding Boeing. And as we said, adding about 75 points to the Dow overall. Leslie, I'll just give you one more chance uh, to uh, add anything else you think we need to watch, whether it involves Muhlenberg specifically in his future or any further shakeout in details that may come now that his exit has been announced. I think we need to see what Calhoun does and whether he's able to calm down, calm down suppliers and, of course, those very important airline customers. And, and they want those planes. We saw United pull these planes until June. And that's a really long time. The second and third quarters, is, that's when airlines, that's their, their peak revenue period. So they want these planes and they want, them, they want them soon and they want some reassurance from Calhoun and they want to see how Calhoun interacts with the FAA. Mullenberg has already been dressed down by, by federal officials and, and I think they want to smooth that over now. Right. Leslie, thank you. Uh, great stuff. Leslie Joseph's covering uh, Boeing for us alongside our own uh, Phil LeBeau. JD.com. Uh, I'm rallying a bit here on this uh, report out of Reuters that the logistics unit is in talk for another overseas IPO, perhaps. See that? I, I yeah. did, yeah. Uh, which would be interesting, of course. You know, sometimes we forget we focus here on Alibaba, but there have been any number of other Chinese companies, and this is one of them that have done very well. Of course, Tencent is not a stock that trades here. It is still one of the largest, if not the largest, single uh, a giant in China. And then there's also been uh, reports about ByteDance, the owner of TikTok, moving its, uh, potentially moving its um, headquarters to another country out of China to try to somehow get itself out of a potential regulatory morass when it comes to the U.S. market. Unclear whether that will actually help, but it's interesting. That is not a public company. 
but it is a value at least of, I'm told, at least $75 billion, if not more. The daily users that they have, Carl, keep growing, and they are in the billion, uh, over a bill, I think a billion and a half, some crazy numbers for TikTok. Uh, Times had this great special section on the decade in tech over the weekend, and one of the milestones really of the decade was TikTok's uh, creation, along with YouTube's first billion hour day and the day Walt Mossberg first laid eyes on the iPad. Uh, Tim Cook taking over for Steve Jobs. Interesting look at where tech has been over the last ten. Well, it's, it's been a it's been a phenomenal decade. It's been a it's been a great one for tech investors too. It's like these innovations have come with a lot of wealth creation, value creation. Speaking yes, well, it's not too early to start talking about the big moves of the year, so to speak, or stories of the year. And certainly, Apple's performance this year in the stock market is one of them, Jim. It's it's approaching an eighty percent gain. Year to date, its market value is now one and uh, a quarter billion uh, trillion dollars. Excuse me. Uh, it's really fairly stunning. With the stock up another one percent, and then even Facebook, which I would argue the story really has been as this year has gone on, a more negative one with each passing month, and yet the stock has done extraordinarily well because the business continues to hang in there despite yeah. the concerns I think that Facebook is raising whether it comes to privacy or whether it comes, obviously, to the political discourse in the country. Well, remember, it was, it was about a year ago when these stocks plunged, Facebook in particular, and I believe it was primarily over the regulatory environment and regulatory concerns and, you know, legitimate concerns that, you know, the way it was affecting elections and privacy issues, could they fix it? But I think what we've seen this year is that none of those concerns really hit the bottom line that, you know, maybe Facebook users are worried about these things, but they're still using Facebook. The numbers are incredible. The revenue streams are incredible. And so there was that huge sell-off, and then there's been an equally large recovery this year. Um, I think Apple was not so caught up in the regulatory issues, but it was dragged down by all of that. But And, you know, concerns that it was tapping out the growth rate of the, of the iPhone. But I really think what Apple has succeeded is part of that long-term vision of theirs. It's created this ecosystem of products. And once you've got the laptop, the phone, I mean, you're going to be drawn increasingly into, the, into this. The question is, how can they further exploit that ecosystem? And I think there's probably a lot of potential there. A remarkable chart, obviously. 282 now and change. Uh, Wedbush today. You saw Dan Ives on our air earlier this morning uh, going to 350 now from 325. Uh, uh, remarkable after having been doubted by many uh, in the first half of the year. So Dow's up 98, uh, S&P 3224. By the way, I want to mention uh, s and is enjoying its best year since 2013. But if we can get to 3249, which is another 25 points, we got to go back to 97, as we said the other day. Yeah. Uh, wow. 22, 23 years ago. Man, how could it be? Yeah, I, I've been wondering. Thank you. Because I've seen 97, I've seen 2010 and 2013, all very strong years. So we're right in there, certainly. But uh, few expected, given especially where we were a year ago, that we would see a 28% plus gain at this point. Uh, but here we are. Yeah, I remember last Christmas. I remember Christmas Eve. I, I think it was the worst Christmas Eve in the market ever. It was uh, It was hard. To, if you're an investor, it's a little Oof. bit hard to be super cheerful. This time, uh, the, the holiday, but we've got a lot to celebrate this year. Uh, this time last year, it was really four sessions where the S&P dropped almost 8% yeah. leading into Christmas Eve, yeah. which was a shortened session. So It reminded me again, you know, it's, it's, it always astonishes me is when stocks are down and they're cheap, that people come to me and say, should I be selling? And it's when they're high and they're expensive, saying, I want to buy. But I remember last Christmas, especially, you know, you get together with family, everybody was saying, oh, my God, I'm feeling maybe I should sell. I'm getting worried. It's, it's going to go down further. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. This is the time. Take a deep breath. Sit, sit tight at the very least. Yeah, you always have that advice in terms of stick with your plan and yes. don't deviate. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Bob Pisani is watching the movers for us today. Good morning, Bob. Slowly advancing. 80% uh, of the Dow's gain is, is Boeing, as you noted here. Just take a look at the sectors. It looks a lot like the fourth quarter uh, today because there's semiconductors, what the sector of the year, what we're moving uh, up 60%. Home builders flattish right now. Another great group up 40% for the year, even though uh, rates have been moving up. China's had a great rally. China shares MCHI uh, since uh, optimism on the trade talks a couple of weeks ago. Industrial is up. And a lot of this is, is Boeing here. Of course, Boeing 
up about 3%. Uh, put up Boeing and some of the suppliers around Boeing, Spirit, Senior, General Electric and Safran, of course, making the engines here. All rallies in the, uh, in, let's call them the Boeing stocks, essentially. Uh, you were talking about how things were looking compared to last year. Jim was mentioned as December. Boy, what a mess here. Remember, this started here uh, on December 5th when the president, this is last year, said he was tariff man. Markets started drifting lower. Then we hit December 19th. That's when the Fed started re hit, uh, 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 hiking rates. Three or four days in a row, we moved to the bottom December 24th. By that time, we were down close to 15% for the month. We did rally come a little bit, closed off of the lows, but worst December 24th ever. Jim's right about that. Just take a look at the last couple of years. It was a common refrain in the fourth quarter, the beginning of the fourth quarter, that we've really gone essentially nowhere f since January of 2018, and the markets have been flat. That's not the case anymore here. This really started in the fourth quarter here, the beginning of October. That's when the Fed started injecting liquidity into the system. Don't call it QD, QE, I know, but October 11th, the market started really moving here, and it's clear that if you think Think of the factors that have led to this fourth quarter rally moving to new highs. The Fed injecting liquidity is one part of that whole question. Just take a look here. So we have more liquidity from the Fed. We have tariff trade war truce hopes. And we have some hopes on the bottom of the global economy. A little bit more clarity, not a lot, but a little more clarity. And you put that together, you've got a very powerful stew that moves the markets up. And you can argue even for a higher multiple on a global market bottom here. S&P 500 for the year up 28%. I keep arguing that this is... Very much a super cap rally. The biggest stocks have really moved the market. The top 10 are up 40%. The top 10 is about 23% of the S&P 500. That's on the high side, although it's not unusual to be over 20%. Just take a look. And the, you guys were talking about Apple so much. Uh, your biggest stocks in the year, Apple. Look, these are the top five. Apple's up 77%. Microsoft, 55 Alphabet, up 30%. And if you look at Amazon, the only stock below the S&P is Amazon. And Facebook up 57 percent. When you've got four of the top five up 40, 50 percent, that's going to move the markets to new highs. Guys, back to you. Yeah, no doubt about that, Bob. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let's get a check on the fixed income markets and head over to Rick Santelli at the CME in Chicago. Rick. Good morning, David. Let's look at a 24 hour of 10. You see it was hit coming into our time zone. Look at a one week. And you can really see how we stall. We have a real tough ceiling to get through in the mid 190s and if you look at an intraday of boons it looks like it was firming up a bit but a two-day gives you the reality similar to our long maturity treasury that particular global sovereign like many also is running up against near-term resistance but it's been trading quite firm finally if we look at the dollar index it's up a little bit right now the one week chart shows a nice steady climb it's hovering just uh, below uh, 97 and three quarters right now, which means for 2019 thus far, dollar index up one and a half percent. At one point, it was up double that. It really did have a nasty November. Carl, back to you. All right, Rick, thank you very much. Jim, that was great. It was fun, right? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, it looked at the news. It's supposed to be Christmas week. <laughs> Join us for the first time on the night and no commercial breaks. None. Let's keep it going, though, man. It's going to be an interesting week. But we're going to be here yes. for it, Carl. Jim Stewart, thanks so much. Thank Good you. To see you. Pleasure. Uh, coming up, a lot more on the big news this morning. If you missed it, Dennis Mullenberg is out as CEO of Boeing. Shares are up, and so is the market. Dow's up 104. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, Now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night, and somehow I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> it was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here, testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch tests harder, so you can buy smarter. 
Visit witch.co.uk. At Asda this Christmas, our whole basted turkey is just £4 a kilo, and our grower selection vegetables are only 20p per pack. Get a broccoli, one kilogram of carrots, and 500 grams of parsnips or sprouts. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores subject to availability. Broccoli, 360 grams, ends 26th of December. With 2020 on the horizon, TuneIn continues looking back at the stories that shaped the 2010s. In 2011, Osam bin Laden is captured and killed by U.S. Special Forces after a decade-long manhunt. In 2016, Donald Trump is elected the 45th President of the United States after securing 304 electoral votes over Hillary Clinton's 227. And in 2018, a U.N. report stating the world has 12 years to prevent irreversible climate change. Search news on TuneIn to be listening when the next decade's big headlines break. Spend Christmas Day listening to the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Featuring five big matchups on the holiday schedule, unwrap the action starting at 12 Eastern when the Celtics take on the Raptors in Toronto, followed by the Bucks and the 76ers at 2.30. The holiday cheers continue with the Rockets and Warriors at 5 and the Clippers and Lakers at 8 and a showdown between the Pelicans and Nuggets at 10.30. Tis the season with the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Hello from the, other side. the 2010s saw yet another revolution in the way we listen to music. With music fans giving up CDs and digital downloads for streaming services and internet radio like TuneIn. At the same time, vinyl sales continue to rise to levels not seen since the format's original decline. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. Good Monday morning. Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. I'm Carl Kington here with David Faber. Morgan Brennan's in for Sarah Eisen here at Post 9 of the New York Stock Exchange. Boeing is the big story of the morning. Dennis Mullenberg is out as CEO, effective immediately. And Chairman David Calhoun will take over in the middle of next month. That's adding to gains for the overall market. Dow's up 102. Record highs for the S&P and the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ shooting for nine straight wins, which would match the longest in over two years. So the melt-up continues, guys, on a busy news day. First, though, let's get to some economic data uh, crossing the tape. Rick Santelli having already brought us durable goods earlier this morning. Hey, Rick. Hi, Carl. Yes, indeed, durable goods, especially that headline, was a disappointment. What With the Boeing story, we know that airlines and transportation have been a big deal. All right, our November read on new home sales. 719,000, that's seasonally adjusted and annualized. It's a smidge light, and 733 in the rearview mirror is downgraded a bit to 710,000. 719, well, obviously it's bigger than 710, so it comes to the month before, which was September, at a whopping 738,000. With that revision, this number's just a bit over 1%. And of course, when we want to dig down really deep and find some uh, important information regarding housing for you to trade and strategize on, we head east toward Diana Olick. Diana, what'd you think of this number? I'm not loving this number, Rick, I'll tell you. It was a miss on the overall number, still up pretty strongly from a year ago, up 17% in new home sales, but the price, that's the thing I'm looking up. $330,800, the median price of a home sold in November. That is up 7.2% year over year. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for this median price to start skewing down because of this extreme shortage of existing homes for sale. So you have all these entry-level buyers trying to get into the new home market. We're looking for more affordable homes, looking for the builders to get into that entry-level product. When I see a 7.2% gain year over year in prices, that's not what we're looking for. Now, we do have a 5.4 month supply. That's just about the same as we had in October. So builders still you know, on the heavier side of supply, existing home supply, very, very low. So again, not loving this number, still up 17% year over year, but down month to month and the October number revised lower. Morgan. Diana, thank you. Following the big story of the day, as you heard Carl mention just a few moments ago, CEO Dennis Mullenberg out after a year of intense scrutiny and setbacks set off by the fatal crashes of the 737 MAX jetliner. Boeing chairman David Calhoun will take over as CEO in January. Here's what he told our Phil Lebeau last month on Squawk Box. My appointment of chairman was very much about division of duty and the, uh, that experience I brought from my aviation days and what I think is the significant overhauls that have to go on inside our, inside our company 
to increase visibility on the subject of safety straight up to the board and right down to the bottom of the organization and create more independence in the functions that represent safety. So joining us now on the phone line is former CEO of Continental Airlines, Gordon Bethune. Gordon, thanks for being with us today. Uh, the news today, the change in leadership, uh, your reaction? Well, uh, inevitable, so to speak, given the current changes or lack of change at Boeing and lack of progress in getting the airplane back. I'm talking about the facts. Uh, certainly the new chairman, Larry Kellner, is well known to me as my successor and a perfect choice for the job. And uh, I believe that David in the new CEO role will really add some value. But I think it shows mostly that Boeing is committed to get this worked out and get it fixed and, and has lost patience with the status quo. Those comments from Calhoun we just played, uh, the fact that there needs to be these changes that basically take place throughout the organization, what do you think that will entail and how quickly can that be implemented given everything that's going on right now? Well, Mr. Calhoun's got a terrific resume and a grand reputation of being a steady, hands-on manager. He was for years at GE and I'm sure that he'll take that same approach within Boeing and get the get whatever it needs straightening out straight, but it'll do it quickly. It won't we won't won't take a long time for him to take action, I'm sure. Yeah, there there had been this expectation at, at least on Wall Street, um, that Mullenberg would be the guy that would continue to, to run this company at least until return to service happened. And obviously with the news today no longer the case, it begs the question, is there another shoe to drop here? Well, it may be, given that they didn't specifically say that, that uh, this was a permanent change to CEO. But uh, I believe personally that, that he'll go in and be such an effective leader, they'll leave him in that spot and he'd be a wonderful CEO permanently. But that's just my two cents. So, Gordon, uh, in, in terms of what it's going to take to fix this uh, system and to see return to service actually happen. The timeline continues to push back. We've had more airlines push back their timeline as well. Uh, what's a realistic expectation? Well, I, I think we've gotten mired down with too many voices and too many you know, people with different agendas in the middle of this. Uh, and that's what I think Mr. Mullenberg lost control of the, of the way forward by being pulled in too many directions with too many new critics with their own agenda. So. Uh, it needs to be a clear case. I think the FAA will, will respect this move as a positive step in restoring not only good relations with them, but committing to change the max to get it certified in spite of the political opposition that it's encountering. Hey, Gordon, what does an Airbus narrow-body sales pitch sound like right now? Do they, do they reference the max? How, how do they leverage it? How do carriers respond? And will it make a difference? Well, I think they'll use their standard, you know, comparative on fuel burn and all the other issues, but they'll also talk about the reliability, stability of the airplane and, of course, the availability, which is what is crucial. You cut, you cut off about half the world's supply of airplanes when you drop the max from production, and there aren't just an Airbus couldn't make enough airplanes to replace that capacity. So the, the max has got to be done. But Airbus will tout that they'll get theirs delivered to you on time, and that's a hell of a sales pitch. So do you see, like, can you imagine a world in which, uh, I don't know, Gary Kelly does have uh, multiple no. brands of carriers? Or both no. brands of models? Well, I, 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 I don't. Look, the 737 MAX is a good airplane, and it will fly, and it will get back. It's a fortuitous path that's been taken. And I can see this is a necessary step to get that jump started again. But there's not enough capacity. I'm talking about manufacturing capacity to replace Boeing. I mean, Boeing is too vital to our economy and the supply chain. And just the growing population of people who traveled year after year and can't keep up. So Boeing has got to survive, and they will. It's just how much torture is it going to be until they get back up and running at 100%, which they used to be and can be again. Yeah, Gordon, it's David. You know, uh, Calhoun has taken over January 13th, of course, as the permanent CEO and president, has already been dealing with the regulators and customers. I'm just curious, what's that conversation between him and the head of an airline like at this point? 
how do you sort of try and make that work? Well, you could trade on one, his track record, which is a good one, Mr. Calhoun is well respected, and a personal representation to a company like United that I am here and we are going to fix it and here's what we've done and here's what we're going to do. He's got a lot of credibility and that's what they need. I mean, it, the, one of the failures that's occurred in Mullenberg's reputation is not a lack of credibility. So that's the necessary adjustment. It's sad. Like Mr. Mullenberg, I think he's a nice man, but Boeing needs to act and they need to act now. And I think the country needs Boeing to get back up on its feet. Gordon, I wonder if enough attention is being paid to the hundreds of planes that are sitting there parked uh, waiting for certification when return to service actually happens. Uh, the fact that the FAA is now going to be doing that uh, rather than Boeing, how big or I guess how far out could this backlog extend and how could that affect production once you do see uh, that facility brought back, uh, brought back to work? Well, that's a really good point. And once you shut up the production line down, it's really difficult to get back started. So it's another couple of months at least just to get back up to the momentum of getting in production cycles. Don't forget the supply chain for this airplane goes all the way down to GE for engines and seat manufacturers and you just name it. And they need all of those parts. So they're going to be kind of predicated on the, the slowest supplier is going to set the pace and that's going to be you know, expensive and long. What do you think it's going to take for pilots to feel comfortable flying this plane again? Well, I think the pilots are. and I, think, I know a lot of pilots and I'm a pilot. I feel comfortable in the airplane today. There's, it's not an airplane problem. The airplane is fine. They've got what's wrong fixed and I, I think they were right to address it. Maybe they were wrong to do it in the manner they did it. But the airplane is very fine. It's an airworthy airplane, but you've got a lot of factionalism between criticism of pilots and training in different country standards. And so everybody's weighing in on who's real problem. It is, in fact, an airmanship issue when you look around the world. And in America, you know, we put pretty high standards for pilots in this country and in Europe. So uh, the pilots are not going to be afraid of the airplane. They're just not. Oh. Well, Gordon, are you arguing that the, the crashes could have never happened with a U.S. carrier? I'm saying that the lack of experience in airmanship is lacking in both of those at detailed examples of where a competent crew member on board would have saved the airplane. Much like the Lion Air day before had that same issue, but they had another captain sitting on the jump seat who saved the airplane. And so when things go wrong, runaway stabilizers are because it's a standard, it's a memory checklist item. You don't look it up in a book, and you know exactly what you do is you disconnect the SAB trim by the emergency cutout switch. You disconnect the auto throttles and autopilot and fly the airplane. None of us, yeah. well, none of that happened. None of it. As a matter of uh, fact, I, I, the opening airplane was at full power, takeoff power, until it crashed. Right. I know you, you and I talked earlier in the year. I tried to ask you whether or not you thought airplanes in general were being over-innovated or whether the movement of those engines on the MAX uh, was too much of a moonshot. You would not go there. Well, you know, I'm not an aeronautical engineer nor a designer. I've worked with them for most of my life. I believe that the airplanes, and we're talking about center of gravity and the way the airplane is, weight is distributed, they were addressing an issue that I think is a minor probability, but they put the safety measure in it. They did it the wrong way. They didn't talk about it, and they didn't publish it, and they made it an option. Those are all mistakes by Boeing. The other mistake is that thinking that every pilot is as good as pilots as you have, and that's not true. You know, not being a Boeing pilot myself, that they train to a higher standard, and that's just it. So I think they co-pilot on the Ethiopian airplane at 300 hours. He's like a passenger. He can't help you. And so it overwhelmed them, and then by the time they got their senses, it was too late. And that's what I think contributed to the deaths. It's not the sole reason, but it's a contributing reason that's significant. Gordon, it's always great to in get your insights. We appreciate it on a day like today. Gordon Bethune. Glad to come. Thank you. When we come back, we'll break down today's big news on Boeing with former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood. Plus, it's one of the top performing IPOs of the year. We'll talk to the CEO when Squawk on the Street comes right back.
Johnson and Johnson. At Asda this Christmas, our whole basted turkey is just four pounds a kilo, and our grower selection vegetables are only twenty p per pack. Get a broccoli, one kilogram of carrots, and five hundred grams of parsnips or sprouts. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores subject to availability. Broccoli, three hundred and sixty grams, ends twenty sixth of December. With twenty twenty on the horizon, TuneIn continues looking back at the stories that shaped the twenty tens. In two thousand eleven, Osama bin Laden is captured and killed by U.S. Special Forces after a decade-long manhunt. In 2016, Donald Trump is elected the 45th President of the United States after securing 304 electoral votes over Hillary Clinton's 227. And in 2018, a U.N. report stating the world has 12 years to prevent irreversible climate change. Search news on TuneIn to be listening when the next decade's big headlines break. As we play out the 2010s, tune in's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Don't believe me, just watch. The 2010s saw the rise of the viral hit when meme ready tracks like Gangnam Style, Open Gangnam Style, The Harlem Shake, Do the Harlem Shake. <laughs> What Does the Fox Say? What Does the Fox Say? And of course, Old Town Road snowballed from internet oddities to global phenomenons. I got the horses in the bag. Keep listening to tune in for more trends of the 2010s. Be better informed, be better prepared. The Better Network is on tune in. This is Brent Musburger. Search B E T R and start hanging out with me and my guys in the desert weekday afternoons. The Better Network is now on tune in. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut the it. The sideline, the man fleet for three. Tune in Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on Tune. I'm faking the lane, turnaround jumper from eight feet is good on Search the right NBA block. today to start listening. Stocks and bonds have been rallying together on track for their biggest gains in more than two decades. The big beneficiary, one of them, is TradeWeb. Debuted this year, has become the top-performing 2019 IPO that had more than a billion-dollar offering. Meanwhile, the listing market under greater scrutiny as the SEC says it's looking into unicorn debuts at the NYSC. Joining us this morning is the co-founder and CEO of TradeWeb, Leo Leski, is here at Post 9, I think, for the first time. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be um, here. You're set to beat the market, even though you didn't have the whole year uh, to do it. Uh, what what do you think has changed overall for your business in 19? Well, I'll say, first of all, we're incredibly proud of TradeWeb. We've been at this for over 20 years, and there's no doubt going public is a pretty big transformational change for the whole company. First of all, I'm here on CNBC, which is exciting. Uh, but, but fundamentally, it's something that we've been trying to get done for a number of years, and we're, we're very proud of where we are right now at TradeWeb. How, how has business changed since the since the offer? Well, I think, you know, it's a couple of different things. First and foremost, uh, people are more aware of TradeWeb. As a public company, uh, we're more exposed. We have analysts following us. We have a lot of different investors. And even our clients around the world recognize us a little bit more. Our financial information is out there, and there's much more scrutiny of our business. So it's a, it's a positive thing. Um. Fixed income has been a little bit slower to adopt electronic trading, electronic marketplaces. Are you finding that that's changing and that that change is accelerating now? Yeah, well, look, the capital markets are going digital, uh, and that's happening across the board. It doesn't matter what asset class you're talking about. Fixed income is a bit more complicated. There's millions of different securities. Uh, we have a global business that's spread out among different regions, different countries. Uh, so it's taken a bit more time for this to gradually move from a phone-based business into a digital business. In fact, today, many markets we're in, we're still only at about 25 to 50 percent electronic. Uh, you did the IPO in April, a follow-on offering in October. What are you using all that capital for? Well, it was a secondary offering. Oh, it was. So okay. essentially what we did was a lot of our long-term investors were able to monetize their position and sell their stock. Yeah. That's always a nice thing, particularly yes. when it's up. How much further can we expect that uh, sort of this democratization, for lack of a better term, of the bond markets worldwide uh, has to go? Yeah, I think it's uh, quite a bit further. As I said before, we're 25 to 50 percent electronic, depending on which market you're in, where in the world, in fixed income. You know, U.S. Treasuries, government bonds are fairly electronic, but they still have a ways to go. So we think there's quite a bit of opportunity left in the business to further digitize things. And as I like to say, you know, once things go digital, that's not the end of it, right? So 
once we have a digital market, then data science kicks in, price discovery becomes more important, and you have a different kind of market that operates and functions. So it's an exciting future for trade web. We finally had this massive spending bill just passed uh, through the Congress and, and signed into law, expected to expand the deficit, thus uh, more issuance of debt for the U.S. Is something like that a tailwind for your business? Well, over the last several years, we've seen a lot more debt issued in markets uh, across the board. Government debt, obviously, corporate debt. Uh, really, anywhere in the world, you have more debt issuance, and we expect that to continue. Uh, the more debt there is outstanding, the more new issuance there is. That's a positive for our market. But perhaps even more important than new debt issuance is volatility in the market. Okay. So as markets become more volatile, more trading occurs, we're really about the trading volume. That's the most important thing for our business. What are your expectations for 2020? We're, we're very optimistic. Uh, you know, the, the business itself, when we look at 19, we've grown volumes about 35%. Over the last three years, we average about a 15% growth of our revenues. Uh, so we're, we're optimistic that we can continue the trends, do more business, get into new products, new regions, and further digitize the markets. Uh, am I going to pay a lot less for trading a corporate bond then? I mean, that has always been the sticky point for so many investors at home, certainly, just what they've got to pay if they want to own these things. Yeah, I think electronic trading affords more transparency. So the more the market participants see where prices are trading, uh, obviously it gets more competitive and pricing becomes better. You think direct listings get a harsh eye in 2020? Uh, not sure. You know, I'm, I'm not really sure about that. I think that there's certainly a lot of people talking about it, interested in it. Uh, it gets back to this whole digitization. And, and are we able to do things more efficiently in a digital format as opposed to what has been manual or voice-based? Right, you mentioned volatility. The, the VIX averaged about 16 this year. The long-run average going back to its creation is 19. Do you think we're going to beat the average? Are you willing to go out there in the next 12 yeah, months? Uh, you know, I don't consider myself an analyst, so I, I, I tend not to make predictions about volatility or, or, or pretty much anything. But, uh, you know, we have an election year next year. There's certainly a lot of political things happening around the world. Uh, so I think to expect a bit more volatility into 2020 is a reasonable assumption. If we get less, uh, there's some who would be surprised. That's yeah. true. Ali, it's uh, nice having you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Happy holidays. You too. When we come back, the key to fighting Amazon will break down Walmart's secret weapon on taking on the tech giant. That's when Squawk, at, Squawk, Squawk on the Street returns. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Ah, Christmas, a time for sharing gifts and laughter and photos and videos. Make the most of it with a SIM-only deal packed with data from Tesco Mobile. It's like a 10-gig SIM for just £13 a month. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile today. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of December. 12-month contract and unlocked 4G-enabled phone required. Terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. I've always loved a kitchen experiment, especially smoothies. I've blended all sorts of mad combinations. Strawberry and charcoal, broccoli and chocolate. Not my best, that. But when I test blenders in the Witch Lab, it's not about flavour, it's about performance. Our tests use proper tough stuff, hard ice, strong veg, rough nuts. And the blenders that can hack it are the only ones we recommend for your kitchen. Witch tests harder so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express, ends 26th of December. Looks, passes on, goes in the end zone, touchdown underneath the crossbar. NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kick off at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. Goes up, dart toward the end. Oh, caught, ball, caught, ball. 
Touchdown for the touchdown of the left quarter. Bucks take the lead. Fire. At home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! Hand off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Walmart announcing a re-emphasis on the giant outlet superstores that it started building in the 80s, saying it's the key to taking on e-retail giant Amazon. As we are just two days away from the Christmas holiday, today the final day to order for Amazon's guaranteed one-day shipping. Retail's been strong in 2019. Look at the ETF uh, XRT up over 10% for the year, dipping slightly this morning. Joining us today talk about this and a lot more, uh, saying things are fine with the American consumer is Jay Rogers Niffin, uh, WWE CEO Jan Niffin. Good to see you, Jan. Welcome back. Hey, great being here. All right, so why why the re-interest in, in superstores? Well, this is really not new news. Doug's been talking about this for a while in pieces. They told us, wow, the super center, we can put stuff in to bring in the customer. They're adding health care services that they're testing, vet care services, eye care, the kind of stuff you have to go someplace to do. So that brings in the customers. The other thing they've done is they've said, we're going to make the super center a lot more efficient so we don't have nearly as much help on the floor, or rather more on the floor, and less doing things like stocking shelves and being in the back room. So they've been able to take hours out of that part of the business. They put robots on the floor to do the cleaning. They put robots on the floor to make sure everything's on the shelf and tell people in the back, bring something out because the shelf's missing an item. And they've built these towers in a couple of test stores where they can automated, do automated picking and packing of goods to be picked up in the store or to be picked up in a drive through That makes the store much more efficient and much more like an Amazon distribution center. And it's a lot closer to the customer. They figured that out a long time ago, and they can right. deliver to you from the store. So these are not new things. They've just kind of put it all together now. Overall, given the fact that this year we talked about so many names that seem to have found a key to the Amazon puzzle, I'm thinking Target just to name one, and Walmart's included too, what do you think is going to be left to impress investors in 2020? I think everybody has figured out the key, right? But some people can do it cost effectively, and Walmart and Target are doing that better than other people, even though it's still a strain for them, because competing with Amazon's tough. But we've all figured out the store is an advantage if you don't have too many of them, if they're not too big, and if they're not too expensive, and if they help you reach the customer. So whether you're Macy's or Kohl's or your Walmart or Target or your Nordstrom's, you've all figured that out. It's just harder and harder to do unless you're a very, very efficient box. The advantage to Walmart and Target is they're very efficient boxes, and they get lots of traffic. Walmart in particular, since it's a grocery store, you know, 58% of their business is grocery. You're there all the time. So they keep that traffic running through to support the store and bring down the cost structure. So this is what we're going to see people do. We're going to see stores close. We're still going to see 12,000 stores close this year. We're probably going to see 12,000 stores close next year. We're still going to see 26 retail bankruptcies. But we're learning to compete in a world where online matters and where the store, too, matters. Everybody needs both, online and store. Amazon knows they need stores. All the online-only guys have been building little stores. Everybody's figured out you've got to be able to do both to serve the customer when and where she wants to be served. Nordstrom's a good example, right? They're building these little 1,500 to 5,000 square foot stores, but they're supported by the big store. Walmart is the best classic case of it, though. They've got 4,500 locations where they can be closer to you than Amazon can. Yeah, Jan, I want to go back to this Walmart versus Amazon, though. I mean, this Wall Street Journal report about the Supercenter, it's talking about edge computing, that Walmart wants to get into edge computing and basically become more of a tech company, create this other higher margin business, potentially, that's going to support it and allow it to keep uh, building out its retail and, uh, and in e-commerce capabilities as well. I, 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 how are the analysts Amazon able to assess that? Is it... But exactly, and it's worked for Amazon, but for a major retailer to get into this, does this muddy the waters, or does it make sense? 
It does both of those. It muddies the waters because none of us really understand it. We don't know how well it's going to work and how fast it's going to happen. But it's clearly something that will work if they can do it effectively because we know that they need more business strategies and we know that being more in touch with the consumer can come from the computing side, not just the retail side. And we know you can build a business there because Amazon has. And we know a lot of people would like to see somebody else in the business besides Amazon. So I don't think I think it makes perfectly good sense. The question we need to have answered now is how fast, how good, and can it be done? Jan, uh, really insightful, and uh, you've been a big help to us all year. Look forward to a lot more in the months ahead. We'll see you soon. Jan Niffin. You too. All right, well, we want to, again, return to uh, the topic of the day, which is Boeing. Obviously, with leadership changes and Dennis Mullenberg out as CEO, David Calhoun, currently chairman, poised to come in as president and CEO Next month, uh, all eyes are on the aerospace giant. However, it was a big weekend for Boeing as well uh, on the space side, specifically within its defense space and security business after Starliner, its unmanned test flight of that capsule, returned safely to Earth yesterday morning, 7.58 a.m. Eastern on Sunday. It touched down at the Army's White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. It was a successful ending to really what was a botched mission uh, in which it failed to dock with the International Space Station uh, after it launched on Friday. You can see right there with the video, it hurtled at about 25 times the speed of sound uh, and about a mile above Earth, three parachutes deployed uh, and the airbags from underneath and it, and it landed in what Jim Bridenstine, the administrator of NASA, called a, quote, absolute bullseye. Uh, so the big question here now is what happens next for Boeing Starliner, especially given everything that's going on at the company in general? Uh, it was an automation issue. It was a, a software malfunction um, that basically caused the spacecraft to not be able to fly and dock uh, with the International Space Station. Um, NASA, Boeing officials are going to be pouring through that data now to figure out what's next, whether it's going to be another test flight without crew or whether they can in the coming weeks, coming months, even potentially move forward without a second test, uh, meaning that the next flight for Starliner could be with humans. Uh, we're going to have to see how all of this plays out as well for the company. All right. Let's send it over now to Rahel Solomon. She's got a CNBC News update for us at this hour. Rahel. Hi, David. Good morning. I sure do. Here is your CNBC News update at this hour. A court in Saudi Arabia has sentenced five people to death for the killing of writer Jamal Khashoggi. He was murdered in the Saudi consulate of Istanbul last year by a team of Saudi agents. No names were given for those found guilty, but three others were also sentenced to prison. A volcano in Ecuador lit up the night sky, spewing incandescent rock and lava down its slopes. It's located in the country's remote Amazon region. Its last major eruption took place in 2002. A United Airlines flight from New Jersey had a bit of a rough landing in Denver last night. The crew aboard flight 2429 reported a mechanical issue after the Boeing 737 landed safely shortly after 7 p.m. Some passengers said they saw sparks on the runway, but no one was hurt. And Luxembourg will be the fun first country in the world to make all public transportation free. This is an attempt to curb traffic congestion. The capital of Luxembourg, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, sees the number of people double during work days. This is due to an influx of workers. All fares will be abolished by next summer. And you are now up to date. That is our CNBC News update for this hour. David, I'll send it back to you. Okay, thank you, Rahel. When we come back, former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood is going to join us on today's big Boeing news. That is when Squawk on the Street returns. Grubhub, America's leader in food delivery. Ah, Christmas, a time for celebrating, unwrapping, and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, 
There's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Spend Christmas Day listening to the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Featuring five big matchups on the holiday schedule, unwrap the action starting at 12 Eastern when the Celtics take on the Raptors in Toronto, followed by the Bucks and the 76ers at 2.30. The holiday cheers continue with the Rockets and Warriors at 5 and the Clippers and Lakers at 8 and a showdown between the Pelicans and Nuggets at 10.30. Tis the season with the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! And off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Welcome back. Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg stepping down immediately with David Calhoun set to take over next month. Let's get to our Phil LeBeau with more. Phil. Morgan, this is how it went down over the weekend. Dennis Mullenberg was fired by the Boeing Board of Directors, and this was a discussion that actually started early in the weekend. The board meeting over the phone, they made the decision on Sunday night, and it's effective immediately. So Dennis Mullenberg is out. Replacing him is the former Boeing chairman, David Calhoun. He now becomes the CEO and president, effective on January 13th. And in terms of Dennis Mullenberg and how he is out of a job, remember, it was just late in October, early November, when I pressed him on whether or not he should remain in the position of CEO. What we're going to do going forward. But you had more than one representative to say, you're not the person, you should resign. Okay. No, I, under I understand those inputs, Phil, and I respect them. But again, uh, my focus here is on uh, taking responsibility owning it. We know what we need to fix. Um, we're making those changes. We're going to continue to get better as a company. And I remain uh, resolute on that responsibility. So what was the straw that broke the camel's back? As you take a look at shares of Boeing, I believe, based on conversations with people within Boeing uh, who were familiar with the thought process there, it was likely that the, the things started to shift starting in November when Dennis Mullenberg and uh, his leadership team said, look, we expect to have this in uh, service or certified by the end of the year, and then back potentially in commercial service by the end of January. That immediately set off the FAA, and then last week was really the final straw that broke the camel's back when the FAA, the head of the FAA, Steve Dixon, called Dennis Mullenberg into Washington, and he said, nope, you don't call the shots here. You're going to take back that, uh, that time frame, and we'll let you know when this plane is ready to go. That was a dressing down, a very formal dressing down of Boeing CEO. And I think that is likely when the board said, this is no longer a tenable situation. It is time for us to make a change in leadership. Yeah, although, Phil, I mean, you've been hearing it, and I certainly have. This board, it's not like it's been lost on them. And in fact, some people have told right. me as well, that very interview you showed, followed by his testimony, uh, at Congress certainly didn't help Mullenberg in terms of securing no. his future. The board was watching closely. That was a terrible performance on Capitol, though. It was really, really bad. Um, you know, it, it, it came across in the worst light in terms of how he answered the questions. Um, it, there was an element there that I heard from people uh, within the company who said, look, he, he comes off not arrogant, but, but clearly not uh, as compassionate as he needs to be in a situation like that, especially when uh, family members and friends of uh, victims uh, who were killed in these two crashes, you know, some of them confronted him. And uh, that was painful to watch. If you were a Boeing supporter or a Dennis Mullenberg supporter, the end of that hearing was really rough to watch because th there were family members of these victims getting in his face saying, get out. You are not the person to be running this company. And I, I think you're right, David. I think that that performance, that's really when things started to shift. And then in November was not a good month in terms of them miscalculating whether or not they could uh, count on the FAA to get this plane recertified by the end of the year, which clearly was never in the cards, but that was the public posture that they took. Yeah. Phil Lebeau, thank you for bringing 
that additional color and, and those insights to us. I have a feeling we'll be seeing a lot more of you today. Thank yeah. you. From his vacation, we should point out. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, for more on, Bo on Boeing, let's get to former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood, who joins us now on the phone. Mr. Secretary, thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Good morning. As Phil just uh, reported that, you know, the straw that essentially broke the camel's back here, the fact that Mullenberg uh, received a formal dressing down by the FAA when it's basically pressed to pull the company's timeline on return to service, I mean, when you were transportation secretary, you too oversaw the grounding of a Boeing aircraft, the 787 Dreamliner, back in 2013. The fact that this would be the dynamic that's taking place, how unusual is it, and what's your reaction to it? Uh, well, I'm not surprised that the board took the action that it took. Uh, when we were involved with the Dreamliner, we were in uh, direct contact with, uh, with Boeing uh, on a daily basis, and uh, we made a decision very early on to ground those planes. The CEO didn't like it at the time, but I didn't really care because uh, I was looking out for uh, for safety. And in the end, I think Boeing uh, ended up uh, in a much better place after uh, we figured out that the lithium batteries were, were causing the fires, and and uh, we figured figured out what the fix should be for that. And it was done hand in glove uh, with safety as the number one priority. And uh, no compromise, uh, you know, no deals. Uh, but let's find the fix and let's fix it. And uh, and uh, I think in the end, uh, probably the board felt that uh, this has gone on too long and, and, and the fix hadn't really been found. And the relationship with the FAA was uh, not as great as it should be. So the fact that we're seeing a change in leadership at the very top right now at this critical juncture in the midst of this crisis, is this something that's going to help the company to move through this uh, perhaps sooner than at least up until a couple of days ago was looking likely? The one, the one thing that the board do to get back on its feet, to get Boeing back on its game, is to hire a CEO who put safety as the number one priority. Find somebody who's got a reputation for safety. Find somebody who uh, is, is just uh, somebody who's got a, a reputation uh, that's impeccable. And uh, the issue for Boeing now is safety. They ha their, their, their safety image has been tarnished. And uh, when, when you see airlines saying, we're not going to fly these planes, they're not going to fly them because they're not sure they're safe. And uh, this, this has to be the number one priority, something that they have to talk about every day, a CEO who has to just drum it in and, all, and, and, and maybe some instances change the culture. Maybe some other heads need to roll in terms of finding the fix and making sure that people understand that Boeing will become the, the safest airline manufacturer in the world. Do you believe that's what's going to happen? We're going to see more changes within management now? Uh, I do I do think that uh, because, uh, you know, you can't lay all the blame on Mullenberg. But the, the fact that the fixes haven't been found uh, goes all the way up and down the chain. And uh, so I would be surprised if some piece of other heads roll. In terms of the actual halt in production of the 737 MAX at this point, uh, is there a critical timeline or, or, or I guess, um, period in which if that halt continues on, uh, on where it becomes harder and harder to bring production back? Look, uh, um, until everybody that's working on the fix gets the idea that the fix is not going to be done until there's 100% assurance that these planes are safe and that that they can be uh, deemed safe by the FAA, uh, then uh, nothing else matters. All right, Secretary LaHood, thank you for joining us on the phone today. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Still to come. To hell with Wall Street. That's the message presidential candidate Bernie Sanders tweeted 
We're going to break it down once Squawk on the Street returns. Well, today, I actually remembered my bag for life. Oh, and I put the bins out for the neighbours. They're on holiday. And the other day, I slipped on black ice with four pints of milk. Hmm, so yeah, I definitely deserve it. Treat yourself this winter. Save on phones, tablets and sims in the O2 Winter Sale. Search O2 Winter Sale. Ends 5th of February 2020. O2 Refresh Credit by Telefonica UK Limited. Eligibility and terms apply. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. That's why I need a one dance. The 2010s was the decade of the surprise album drop. I see it, I want it. Where artists from Beyonce, Drake, and Frank Ocean to Radiohead, U2, and the late David Bowie skipped the traditional promotion cycle to bring their music directly to fans with little to no warning. Keep listening to tune in for more trends of the 2010s. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Looks passes on goes in the end zone. Touchdown underneath the crossbar. NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kickoff at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. Goes up, dart toward the end. Oh, caught, ball, caught, ball, touchdown for the touchdown of the left corner. Bucks take the lead. Fire at home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Nobel laureate Robert Schiller says the record rally will stretch on, but there could be a price to pay. Find out more on Trading Nation at CNBC.com. More Squawk on the Street is coming up. So Schwab, tell me about... Whether you call yourself a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or something else... The road to 2020 is on tune in. Oh, what a night! It, and, and a, a complete earthquake. This was follow earthquake. every step of the Democratic primaries while hearing the latest headlines from the White House with live 24-hour news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox News Talk, and more. We're closing in on the first results in the battle for the White House. It is Experience be- the election through the sources you trust with the nonstop news channels on tune in. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! And off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. CNBC is out with its latest millionaire survey with the debate, of course, on the wealth tax waging on. Our Robert Frank joins us. He's got the results for us. Robert. Good morning, David. Well, a majority of American millionaires actually support a wealth tax as long as it hits people who are wealthier than they are. Now, 59% of millionaires support a federal tax of 2% on wealth over $50 million. That's according to the CNBC Millionaire Survey, which polls more than 700 people with investable assets of $1 million or more. But the support falls to 48% if the tax hits those with $10 million or more. And the richer millionaires were barely even more opposed. Nearly half of those worth $5 million or more would oppose a wealth tax. Now, Elizabeth Warren proposing a wealth tax of 2% on those with $50 million or more, 6% on billionaires. But critics say the threshold would probably have to drop in order to raise as much revenue. Now, millionaires also feel like they pay enough already. 60% say they pay their fair share of taxes, and a third say they pay more than their fair share. But it varies by party. 88% of Democratic millionaires support a wealth tax compared to only a third of Republicans. But millionaires also also think a wealth tax is unlikely to happen anytime soon. When asked about the biggest threat to their wealth, only 8% said taxes. 
What, what, what are the other threats? What's what the there? bigger threat? The, the biggest by far is government dysfunction. And of course, that the definition of that depends on what your party is. What's interesting, as I've covered the wealthy for 16 years now, the polling used to depend on what your wealth level was, what your demographic was, education, geography, what your the source of your wealth. Now it's all by party. So hmm. less dependent on what level of wealth you are, and it's all, if you're a Democrat, you support a wealth tax, government dysfunction is probably the Republicans. If you're a Republican, the dysfunction means it's the Democrats. Wow, that's stunning, but not surprising. Yeah. Exactly. In our uh, current age, unfortunately, yep. that seems seems to be the case. So it's anybody but that. Anybody but that's them right. is fine. Now, that's right. We should point out, I mean, again, we Elizabeth Warren has fallen in the polls, but yeah. nonetheless, she's at 2% above 50 and 6% above, above a billion. billion. And look, the, we, we also know, and we have this article online, we'll talk about later today, the millionaires support Joe Biden over Trump, so Biden would beat Trump among millionaires. But he's talking about a big capital gains increase that would really affect this group, so we're going to have to ask them, because I would suspect the capital gains tax increase would be much more important to this group than a wealth tax. All right. <clears throat> um, where does Bernie stand on all this stuff, by the way? On well, his his wealth tax is even steeper Higher than is he, he goes up to eight percent on, on the top rank, and you know, of course, he's not doing great in the polls. But but we we're, we're asking this group about the the Warren plan, which is already. 10 or 20 times higher than the highest wealth tax levels that we've ever had in Europe. So what, what's different about her wealth tax than any other we've ever had, including those in Europe, is that 2 or even 6 percent. Europe, the rates have typically 0.3 percent. So Bernie's even more extreme you than that. You pointed out as well, though, Robert, I think that it's not, we should not just, it's not just the wealth tax. It's also the change in, the, in Social Security earnings right. top that would impact a lot of people. Yeah, so when you add the wealth tax to taxing the gain on that wealth, you're actually you could get, get rates of over 100% on any kind of asset gain or investment gain when you combine those two taxes. Robert, thanks. Thank you, Good guys. Good to see you, Robert Frank. Uh, we're seeing some headlines uh, regarding the FAA now uh, and the 737 MAX. We'll turn to Phil LeBeau. Is, Phil, is this what you have? Yeah, Carl, we've got some color on this. Incoming CEO for Boeing, David Calhoun, has had a phone call this morning, a conversation with Steve Dixon, the head of the FAA. And according to those who are familiar with the conversation, two important quotes from this conversation from David Calhoun to Steve Dixon. The first one, we welcome rigorous oversight. The second one, Calhoun, in, in the conversation with Dixon, said Boeing wants to be regulated. The importance of these two comments within this conversation are very clear. This is a, a, the worm has turned, so to speak. You compare this with Dennis Mullenberg's relationship with Steve Dixon, which was frosty in the beginning and pretty much non-existent towards the end. The fact that David Calhoun, within hours of being named, the new president and CEO, effective January 13th, has reached out to the head of the FAA, sends a very clear signal that Boeing wants to get this fixed and do it right, do it right away. And so the conversation this morning between Calhoun and Dixon, very clear. Boeing is saying, you know what, FAA, you're going to have to do what you're going to have to do, and we're going to work with you. We are not fighting you in this process. We will work with you in order to get the 737 MAX recertified. Guys, back to you. All right. So, so Phil, on the tape here, uh, uh, sort of a corollary to what you're saying, the FAA is saying first priority is safety. We have no set timeline for when the work Correct. will be completed, right? That's the same, that, and that's the same stance that the FAA has taken for some time. The FAA ha all along, Carl, has said it's ready when it's ready when it's ready. And repeatedly, Boeing would miss deadlines or overpromise and underdeliver. And I heard this quote last week from uh, one uh, regulator within the FAA who, uh, when I was discussing incoming data that was supposed to be turned over uh, in the course of this, the person said, it's kind of hard to judge homework when it's not turned in. That says it all. And that was emblematic of what's happened between Boeing and the FAA over the last six months. So clearly, this conversation between David Calhoun and Steve Dixon is the beginning of Calhoun saying, things are changing. This will be a different approach to working with the FAA and getting the 737 MAX recertified. Right. But, Phil, this is not the first. I mean, Calhoun has been speaking to regulators and customers as the company's chairman for, for some time now, hasn't he? He has been talking with them, but not with the level of 
uh, urgency that is there now. I think that there was always an element of Dennis Mullenberg is working with the regulators in terms of getting the MAX uh, recertified. And in terms of the customers, David, um, let's be clear here. Dennis Mullenberg was never terribly close with airline CEOs. He is not a terribly social person in that regard. He wasn't rude to them. He wasn't he wasn't nasty to them. But he is not uh, somebody who, when you talk with airline CEOs, they say, well, there's a warm relationship there. It was a workable relationship, um, but it was not a warm relationship. You can bet that that will change under David Calhoun. He realizes yeah. the importance of talking with these CEOs, and it goes simply beyond, here's our aircraft, here's what's going on. Phil, thank you. Phil LeBeau. You bet. He's going to get a comp day. We'll make sure of that. Uh, all right. Uh, before Phil came on with that breaking news, we were talking, of course, with Robert Frank about the wealth tax. Let's get back to that proposal, various proposals, the potential implications as we head into next year. Let's bring in Jared Bernstein, senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and Tony Fratto, the founder of Heritage Place Strategies. Tony, I guess the first place to start as we head into next year, are we still going to be talking about this as a legitimate concern slash question as to whether it's going to be an issue that is pursued by whoever the Democratic nominee is? I don't think so, uh, in all honesty. I mean, we may be talking about taxes because we've we've always talked about taxes in these debates, and we'll be talking about maybe different schemes, and Jared probably has some other ideas for taxes uh, <laughs> that he might want to put on the table. But I think this one is going to see its day by the time, you know, in a, in a, in a couple months. Uh, because you know, it's pretty clear that it's unworkable. It's not the kind of thing that's likely to happen. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are where they are on it. They will talk about it, but I think it's going to fade. Jared, do you agree? I partially agree, but first let me say happy holidays to everybody, including my old friend Tony, who I don't see enough of these days since he uh, too, left Jared. us for New York. Uh, I don't. I disagree with one point there. I disagree with the notion that the wealth tax won't be an issue. In fact, it, uh, I'm pretty sure it will be. Now, as Tony suggested, it probably won't be uh, this Warren idea that really can get to, as Robert said, 100% confiscatory rates. I don't uh, see a good rationale for that. But the notion that we don't tax wealth uh, much at all, that most uh, wealth accumulation, uh, particularly unrealized gains, goes untaxed, and that there are lots of other ways to get at this. Tony's right, I got a list. And so do, more importantly, all the other candidates. I think that's gonna stay on the table. So Jared, just to dig into that a little bit more, I mean, there have been studies out there uh, done pushing back against a wealth tax and saying that they, historically, when they've been implemented in different places around the world, have never raised as much revenue as uh, they promised to. How do you make that, I guess, I, I guess how does that yeah. get rectified and, and how do you get past that argument? So. Uh, good question, uh, and two responses. One is that we can learn from mistakes that other countries have made. Uh, Europe, I think, screwed up the base. Uh, if you allow too many exemptions, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, they tax on uh, residency. We tax on citizenship. That's really different. And in these days of, of capital mobility, you got to hold hands with a lot of other countries, and we now have a mechanism to do that. It's called the FATCA. Uh, it, it would have to be beefed up. But on the revenue side, let me say this. I have seen estimates of the Warren revenue uh, uh, tax, of uh, the Warren wealth tax, that say instead of collecting three trillion, like she says, or 3.7, uh, we think we'll collect something like between two and three. That's still really high, and in fact, I find it surprisingly high, and it's much needed revenue. So yeah, you can lose, there's so much wealth up there that you can lose a lot of the revenue and still come home with something meaningful. Yeah, Tony, I would just say it that seems the waste, as though, yeah, go ahead, uh, go ahead. I just said the ways of getting at it, though, are pretty, are pretty outrageous. I mean, you have to, the administrative task of actually getting at all that wealth on an annual basis is really onerous. It wasn't just the lack of, you know, being able to access the revenue. I mean, there are, there are ways to avoid, you know, some of them, some people give to places like the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities <laughs> to pay Jared, you know, that's a that's tax, a very good you know, <laughs> shelter, but also, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's being very productive. But you know there there are there are ways to get around it. But that's not even the biggest thing. It's just that it, administering it is really cumbersome, really difficult. Assessing and auditing to trying to get at it is really clumsy and difficult. There are better ways to do it. Like yeah. what, so look, Tony? 
Um, I don't disagree. Well, look, if you want to just oh, raise ahead, revenue, like I mean, you know, a lot of economists, you know, if you look at a VAT, you don't have the constitutional problems that you have with the wealth tax, which is something we didn't get into. But it's very clumsy, also. You can, it's pro probably unconstitutional. VATs are really efficient. You can raise money that way. They're not direct taxes; they're indirect taxes. So that's a you know great idea. I could do more of the, you know, the, capping the salt tax was. Uh, was a good reform, in my opinion. There are other, you know, upper middle class tax protections uh, like the mortgage interest deduction that you can do things with. There are lots of things that you can do without getting into these kinds of problems and really administrative burdens. Let me say Captain one thing. Tax was a terrible idea, Tony. Sorry, go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> I'm with Tony on that one. Um, hey, look, here's the thing, and, and you can't, if you, especially if we're talking about the Democrats' agenda, you really can't uh, underemphasize this point. Going from a wealth tax to a, a sales tax or a VAT or consumption tax is going from a very highly progressive tax to one that is far more regressive. And so while uh, public finance economists love VATs and I understand why, taxing consumption versus savings, I get the economic rationale, uh, that is not the path towards greater progressivity. And another reason why all these Democrats Bernie, uh, Senator Sanders, why, why they're uh, so, uh, Warren, why they're so into the wealth tax is because of the extent of wealth concentration. You know, the Federal Reserve just came out with some new numbers. The average net worth of households in the top 1% is about 26 million. The average net worth of all those households in the bottom half is about 27,000. So that's a, a thousand yeah. X times the difference. So, it's, so there's a progressivity here that you really try to miss if you go from taxing wealth to taxing consumption. Let me give uh, Tony the last, uh, last word here. And broadly speaking about taxes, by the way, border adjustment tax was, a, was part of the original tax reform yeah. plan. Um, what are we going to be talking about in the campaign coming up next year? Is it, I mean, taxes will take center stage. Republicans seemingly will be defending the tax cut of two years ago. And the Democrats will be putting forth, it would seem, a number of different proposals to raise taxes. Who's going to win that debate? Well, look, I, th that's going to come down to a choice between two people. And we don't know who, what, who, who the other person is yet. I think, we, I think the set of issues, though, uh, taxes, health care, things like you know, climate and, and energy and what are we going to do about those issues real kitchen table issues like education. I think, you know, look, Bernie's right to be talking about education. Everyone ought to be talking about college education, something we want to see more of. His idea of, you know, wiping out, you know, all the debt isn't a great idea, but th these are things that parents are worried about, what their kids are going to do in the future, what are the opportunities for them. Yeah. Uh, well, Jared and Tony, thanks for uh, sticking around there during our breaking news and uh, good conversation. Happy yeah. holidays to you both. Thanks. Thank you. You too. It is 10 a.m. at Boeing's headquarters in Chicago. It's 11 a.m. on Wall Street. Squawk Alley is live. Morning. Welcome to Squawk Alley. I'm Carl Quintanilla at Post 9 with Morgan Brennan. Julia Borston's in for the hour joining us as John Ford has the morning off. It's been a remarkable Monday morning, of course, and Boeing is the big news of the day. Dennis Muhlenberg is out immediately as CEO. Our Phil LeBeau has more this morning. Hey, Phil. Hey, Carl. The decision reached Sunday night by the Boeing Board of Directors to fire Dennis Muhlenberg. Replacing him will be the former Boeing chair. I get he's technically chair, and now he'll be step down out of the chair and become president and CEO. That's David Calhoun. He becomes president and CEO effective on January 13th. So what was the final straw that broke the camel's back? Well, in large part, it was the relationship between Boeing and the FAA, which is completely broken down over the last several months. I've learned from sources that this morning, David Calhoun called the head of the FAA, Steve Dixon. It was a short but amicable, amicable uh, phone call in that call. Cal Calhoun said to Dixon, Boeing welcomes rigorous oversight. He also said that Boeing wants to be regulated. This is a big change in tone for Boeing compared to where it was just a few months ago. But in terms of whether or not Dennis Mullenberg was not going to be in the job for long, it was expected for some time that his tenure would be short. This is our conversation with him on the halls in the halls of Capitol Hill uh, just a couple of months ago. 
have there been discussions with the board that maybe once this is certified and the plane returns to service, it's time for you to transition out of the CEO job? Phil, those aren't uh, discussions that uh, I'm involved in, or is that my focus? Uh, my focus here is on the job at hand. Uh, we have important work to do for the world. We know that uh, the work we do matters. Um, safety is at the very forefront of that. Uh, we have always been focused on safety, quality, and integrity as our core values, and that demands a sense of excellence in how we do our work. That's where my focus is. Those comments on October 29th came just a couple of weeks before really where things went south for Boeing, and that's when the company put out guidance that it expected the 737 MAX to be recertified by the end of the year. That guidance was put out on November 11th, and almost immediately we heard from people within the FAA, both in an official capacity as well as people within the FAA who are working on regulation of the 737 MAX who were like, what? They don't tell us what to do or when to have it done by. There are a number of steps that still need to be cleared, and they're nowhere close to that. That was the beginning of the end, guys, and then you had the decision about a week and a half ago uh, where the FAA basically came out and they said it on Squawk Box to me. They said, we have no time frame for certifying this plane. It's not going to happen in 2019. It'll happen sometime in 2020. And a week and a half later, Boeing has made the decision. Dennis Mullenberg is fired. Now David Calhoun has to try to, as quickly as possible, repair that relationship and get the MAX back in the air. Phil, is there reason to expect more management changes subsequent uh, to this news now? Not major management changes. I think you're going to see perhaps some changes within people who are just a level below. Um, Look, they already made the change in terms of Boeing commercial airplanes. Stan Deal was brought in. Kevin McAllister was let go. That was a couple of months ago. And I think Stan Deal, he's going to be in lockstep with David Calhoun in terms of approach to doing the job. Uh, the way Stan Deal has been described to me is very detail-oriented, not somebody who is going to try to run before he can walk in terms of the commercial airplane and the 737 MAX and getting it recertified. So I think we're not going to see major management shifts here at, at Boeing. I think for now what you're going to see is David Calhoun is going to have his team put together a game plan and then start executing it as quickly as possible. But one thing you won't see, Morgan, you will not see projections in terms of when they plan to have this plane back in the air. Yes, as you've just reported. Phil LeBeau, thank you. Joining us now here at Post 9 is Sheila Kayalu, aerospace and defense analyst at Jefferies. She has a buy rating and a 420 price target on Boeing. Also with us, CNBC.com airline reporter Leslie Josephs. Good morning to you both. Sheila, long time no see. Thanks, Morgan. <laughs> Only two hours. Um, stocks rallying on this news. It's up almost 3% today. Uh, your reaction to it? I think the Starliner was the cherry on top, and people are viewing this really? as the bottom of the bad news. I mean, it was just... You know, Calhoun has an experience on with GE. He was head of GE Aircraft Engines from 2000 to 2003. He was on GE. He led GE Infrastructure. He's on CATS board. He has big industrial experience. So maybe the engineering precision isn't quite as tight as it should be at Boeing. And I think this signals this is the end of it, and this is the end of communicating on when return to service will happen. Phil just mentioned that he doesn't anticipate any other big management changes, maybe some movement one level down. Do you think that the company now has the management structure in place that it needs? Do you feel confident about the leadership at this point? You saw Stan Deal took over from the services business into commercial aircraft. Ken, Kevin McAllister was the first resignation, uh, Dennis being the second, clearly. So I do think the management changes are over. But when you look at the board, there's 13 to 14 members. The average age is 63 years old, seven years of tenure on the board. So maybe looking at GE, they've had their entire board shift over essentially in the last 24 months. Maybe you could see some changes to the board, how it's composed. Is it 13 members? Is it 18? Does it go to 10? Uh, maybe some changes there. Yeah. Yeah. Calhoun's been on the board since 09, right? Yes. He's been there for... He has 10 years of board experience, yes. so quite a bit. Uh, so he's been there since, and for most of the Max's development, I'm assuming. Is that enough fresh thinking, or, do, is, or does the company want to err on the side of stability and experience within Boeing rather than bringing in someone who's completely new? I, I think he has a lot of experience. The, the press release doesn't signal he's an interim CEO. It seems like he's going to be CEO for the next five years or so or whenever it is. Um, and you've seen another uh, head of board of directors, right? So this is the another chairman role, three and four months. Um, quite a bit of change already on that front. But, but I guess my question is, you think he's 
the right the right person to carry this forward. I think you need somebody with industry experience and company experience. This is not like GE where you're Immelt's gone and you're bringing in Larry Kopp, somebody with operational experience. You need somebody fairly close to the situation. So I think this is the right fit for now. All right, I want to bring Leslie into the conversation as well. Leslie, it's been a rough year, not just for the company itself, but for the workforce as well. And then, of course, you had that halt to production last week. What does this leadership change uh, do for morale within the company? Well, so far, nothing has changed. The, the uh, stoppage to the production is not going to even take effect until January. We have no idea how long that's going to last. Um, even when the FAA got news of Mullenberg's replacement, of course, they don't comment on personnel changes, they reiterated, we are in charge of this process, kind of showing some teeth again to Boeing. So they're not going to rush this through. And we have no way of finding out how long that, that this could possibly last, um, which will have, of course, impacts on the suppliers like Spirit, which makes the fuselages. Uh, and all the way down to airline pilots, which are, are missing overtime uh, and complaining about that. Yeah. Sheila, I mean, you and I have talked about this before, but, and you mentioned Starliner. We had that launch. It was, uh, did not go as expected over the weekend, although they did have a successful landing uh, on Sunday. There have been issues with KC-46 tanker on the defense side. Uh, they've decided to opt out of bidding for uh, the new ICBM contract as well. There have been other things plaguing this company uh, throughout the year, too, maybe perhaps overshadowed by 737 MAX. The 777X delay. The yes. One, so. Thank you. Yes. Um, so how should we take all of these, put all of these together? How do investors need to think about that? I think we talked about this earlier this morning is there's a reason there's only two commercial OEMs out there. There's Airbus and Boeing. Bombardier and Embraer have joined forces with each of them respectively. There's a handful of defense OEMs. So this is really hard. Development programs are always delayed, and this isn't something new. But I think investor perception and credibility have gone out the door as we've been too optimistic about the return to service. So the board signaled that there needed to be a change, but I don't think there needs to be a cultural overall at Boeing. It is fairly difficult, and we have to kind of honor that. Uh, and Leslie, in terms of the messaging, I think I saw some reporting from you this morning that there were some internal notes uh, about the leadership changes as well, right? Yeah, and uh, Greg Smith, the CFO, moving in as interim CEO, uh, at, at least until the middle of January, just trying to calm everyone down. Um, but there is a tone of, we felt that this was the best way, by making this change with Mullenberg, to restore trust. And that's one of Boeing's biggest challenges right now. It's not just the FAA, although that's the, probably their biggest hurdle. But they have airline customers whose uh, compensation from this is growing uh, every day as this goes on. Uh, so restoring trust is, is what the uh, the main message is. And Sheila, what's your perspective looking forward to, to 2020, this issue of restoring trust, but then also, um, I'm looking at your note, you say halt production with no timeline creates timing abyss. Trust in terms of the planes getting delivered on schedule as well as trust in the company's products themselves. What's your, your outlook? Yeah, so I think the, pre the press release last week, last Monday night, when they stopped production was basically to signal that we're no longer going to comment on return to service. Um, so for now, you know, we don't have a timeline on that. What we have from the uh, European regulators was suggesting a February timeline in terms of the, the aircraft returning to service. So we'll see. I think you can make that bet that the 737 MAX return to service sometime. We keep our buy rating because we think it's within 2020, and it's about how quickly Boeing could get through the inventory and what kind of challenges are associated with that. All right. I'm sure more will be revealed. <laughs> Sheila and Leslie, thank you for joining us today with the latest uh, on the leadership changes at Boeing. Stocks rallying. Want to mention the Tesla has hit its all-time high of 420. It's pulled back a bit, but that did hit that number. If you remember back in August of 2018, Elon Musk tweeted, I'm considering taking Tesla private at 420, funding secured. Uh, Musk has tweeted in the past few minutes just now saying, whoa, the stock is so high, LOL. So Elon is well aware of uh, <laughs> the shares hitting this, <laughs> this milestone. Too soon? Too yeah. soon for that joke? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe. When we come back, our breaking up Amazon, we'll talk about that as well, why one of the company's first employees says it's time, plus the fall of Skywalker. We'll break down the numbers of uh, Disney's highly anticipated Star Wars movie, which opened to what some say is a disappointing opening weekend. Squawk Alley's back after this. There's a lot of talk about value out there, but if... Ah, Christmas, a time for sharing gifts and laughter and photos and videos. Make the most of it with a SIM-only deal packed with data from Tesco Mobile. Like a 10-gig SIM for just £13 a month. 
It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile today. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of December. 12 month contract and unlocked 4G enabled phone required. Terms apply. See tescomobile.com/terms. Hey NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. TuneIn is remembering the biggest college sports moments of the decade, like this one from 2018, when Alabama's Tua Tagovailoa throws the game-winning touchdown in the national championship against Georgia. Loads up, looks long, throws, end zone, touchdown! Touchdown, Alabama! Devontae Smith! Touchdown, Alabama! And the Crimson Tide has once again ascended to the top of the college football... Search college sports on TuneIn to be there for the moments that go down in history. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Follow Famous. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. The SEC reportedly investigating Slack and other listings on the NYSE after the last five years, looking specifically at how trading was handled on the first day. Will the probe dis- deter startups and other companies from going public in 2020? Joining us this morning is Recode's co-founder, CNBC contributor Kara Swisher. Kara, good morning. Good to see you. What do you think about this? How much attention does this really deserve? Well, I don't know. It seems like it came from the complaint from the floor traders on the price of the stock It's on the first day. Slack, like a lot of these companies, like Spotify, did a direct listing, and it's handled a little differently than other listings that bankers do, the more traditional listings. And so I think it's some uh, some dispute about the price, the lower price on the very first day. Now, I'm not a technical Wall Street person, but I think it's looking into how it was handled by Citadel, which was its direct uh, manager of the, of the, of the, uh, of the listing, and how how pricing was done and whether people got advantage due to the pricing. So I'm not sure it's going to be the biggest deal or deter IPOs. I just think that that, that will be, uh, according to markets, how it's being done and whether these direct listings will be done by more tech companies, which several of them have. Kara, looking forward to next year and the fact that some of these companies like Airbnb um, could be in the IPO pipeline, do you anticipate an yeah. Airbnb IPO, what are the other big ones, and do you think they'll go the route of direct listing or traditional IPO? I suspect Airbnb has already uh, talked about doing an IPO. I, the CEO, Brian Chesky, has talked about it quite publicly. He was trying to uh, get, get the talk away from it from this past year um, to say that we're doing it in 2020. I think it depends on how their business is going, obviously, and how the market is. I think all of them depend on that. I suspect that will be the biggest IPO of this year. Um, and I'm guessing they'll go a traditional route over a direct listing, but you never know. I mean, there's lots of choices here. Um, it's just a question of how much money they need, how much money they need to raise, uh, and, and other things to, to pick which one they're going to do. Um, and Carol, if look- I had to guess, it would be a traditional listing. And looking at the SEC probe and also looking at the mm-hmm. performance of some of these IPOs this year, what do you think mm-hmm. is going to change with the IPOs or direct listings next year? 
Well, whatever whatever happened with Slack, in this case it's Slack and some other direct listings, the, the, the market has spoken about these companies. And the, the stocks are, what is it? I think the Slack opened in the, in the high 30s and now is in the low 20s. And so a lot of these, uh, these IPOs like Uber and some others are really, you know, in the doldrums. And I think that's really the issue is whether these companies were, one, ready to go public or if they took too long to go public and didn't have the kind of uh, businesses that Wall Street is looking at now. And I think Wall Street is doing a forcing function on a lot of these companies to really think hard about the economics of their business. And I, that's really the story here. This is this might be just a dispute between sellers on the very first day, and I don't think it indicates any larger thing. I think the larger thing is whether these companies are ready for prime time um, or if they're too highly valued. And that, I think, is going to be a big debate given the performance of a lot of these unicorn companies. Yeah. I mean, Kara, I can't help but think, though, that this is pushback to what has become a big push towards more companies doing direct listings overall. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that happened this month, you had the NYSE file paperwork to basically create a new type of hybrid direct listing that's going to let companies raise capital. Within about yeah. a week or so, the SEC said, nope, we're rejecting this. Um, and, and it comes after what was seen as, I think, something of a tipping point in Silicon Valley in terms of rethinking yeah. the way companies come to the public market. So what does this do to that, I guess, trajectory? Well, I think it's, you know, it's something that companies have done many times. It's, it's, it has a long history in Silicon Valley, and tech companies were some of the first to really popularize these, these kind of listings. I do think a lot of people here have, have a, a problem with the way public offerings are done, including how these, these stocks are priced on the first day and how much money is left on the table for the company. And so I don't see there's not going to be a change in how the listings are done. You know, banks have a very uh, strong constituency on Wall Street and have a lot of power and can't be loving something that has less fees. Um, but I think they're going to continue, Silicon Valley companies are going to continue to try to find ways, new ways to do listings, especially if they don't need the money necessarily or if they don't want to be doing this dog and pony show that you have to do as part of a, of a public offering. So I don't think that that's going to change that much. I think there's going to be pushback as more and more of them do it in terms of how they're done and rolled out. But I don't think it's going to be a, there's going to be a decline in them due to this. Necessarily. Yeah, yeah. You do have to consider what role uh, the investment banks mm -hmm. and underwriters are, are having in all of this. Uh, Kara, piece sure. out of Recode over the weekend that one of Amazon's mm -hmm. first employees said the company should be broken up, which obviously has echoes of things we've heard from other first employees of other names and fang. Yeah. How is this one any different? Well, I don't know. It's not. It's like, is this the Chris Hughes of, uh, of of Amazon? I don't think so. This is a very early employee who was very critical to building the website, and he had made a comment on a New York Times article uh, that Jason Del Rey, who writes for Recode, noticed, and then she did an interview with him. And I think he's he's echoing what a lot of very early employees of a lot of these companies who benefited, you know, quite well from being there. Um, have with the companies, which is that a lot of the stuff they're doing, even if they're doing amazing things, which this employee said, um, they also feel some culpability for the damage. And in this case, he, this employee thought that, uh, that the marketplace should be separated from the retail business of Amazon because it, was, uh, it, would, it gave Amazon undue advantage to be monitoring sellers and then selling against the sellers. And he's got a point. I think this is not anything that Elizabeth Warren hasn't pointed out, I haven't pointed out. Most people, uh, and that time series was about that also, was about what are the advantages Amazon gives itself by owning the marketplace, selling in the marketplace, and running the marketplace. It, it does feel a little you know, like the casino, and I think that's what he was, was talking about. Kara, we are hearing so much concern about the way that Amazon is exploiting the data from those third-party mm -hmm. sellers, and it's not yeah. just this, you know, this, uh, you know, early employee of Amazon. We have the FTC looking into business practices, the House of Representatives, all scrutinizing those Amazon business practices when it comes to third-party sellers. Right. Do you think we'll see regulatory action next year, or do you think Amazon will make changes to avoid regulatory oversight of that area? I don't see how they can avoid any regulatory oversight. Something's coming. You know, I've talked to uh, people at the Justice Department, at the FTC, and elsewhere, and I think they all feel that this, this marketplace, even though Amazon tries to put it against a, a backdrop of all of retail, which is a good point, there's lots of retail everywhere, they dominate online retail. And in a very similar way to how people felt about Microsoft 
in the software business a long time ago, people feel about Amazon is that you can't compete. And there's enough stories that I think that they're going to have to somehow respond to the idea that they can't, you can't run the game and then own the game and play the game. And you know what I mean? It just, it just, it's a difficult one for Amazon to, to do, even though they talk about using aggregate information when they get into businesses. Um, if you're a business like the, the Allbird CEO and you're selling a product and they sell a similar product suddenly, it make you know, it's visually very problematic for, for Amazon, even, uh, even if they're, they're not using the data in the ways people think they are. Um, so I think they're going to have to figure out a way to, to, to assure sellers, and not just big, small ones, but big ones too, that it's a fair marketplace and that people are getting their due and they're not pushed down in the listings. It seems pretty clear that it's going to be one of the big issues they face in the next year, and it's where they're very vulnerable. Um, I'm not sure if you saw this report from the Wall Street Journal over the weekend about Walmart's secret weapon displayed off Amazon, the Supercenter, in which it talks about uh, the fact that the retailer is thinking about getting into edge computing to better counter Amazon and be be able to fund its own efforts uh, to take on Amazon. It it really struck me, the fact that you'd have a retailer looking to become more of a tech company. Well, you know, it's funny that it's Walmart that's sort of prone here. You know, I mean, it's, we're going to fight back Walmart, which, of course, used to scare retailers across the, the country when they would move into, yeah. a, uh, you know, an analog store next to a, down, a Main Street, which they were blamed for killing off Main Street. And so it's really, it, you know, I think all these companies have to think about what they are and how they use data. And, you know, Walmart was really well known for using data better than other retailers back in the day. And now, of course, they're competing with Amazon. And so they have to have these advantages of using the massive amount of data that Walmart gets uh, better to better, you know, sell, essentially. But the fact that Walmart is, is, is the one that's sort of the number two here is fascinating. And, and and acting like a number two, which is which is unusual, I think, given yep. their size. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. uh, Disney's down almost a full percent this morning as uh, Star Wars hits the box office with some muted sales after underwhelming reviews. Julie has been watching this all morning long. Well, I think you have to be careful when you say muted sales because Disney brought in $176 million at the domestic box office. It's the 12th biggest opening of all time. For any other studio compared to any other franchise, this would be a massive opening. But for Star Wars, the expectations were a little bit higher. Of the three Star Star Wars films that have been released in this trilogy. This one has the lowest opening. The prior two were 220 million, 250 million. So this is the lowest of those three. It was weighed down by negative reviews, less than 60% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's considered a rotten score in Rotten Tomatoes. And the audience response has not been as positive as all of the other films that Disney has released from Lucasfilm, um, which would include Solo and Rogue One, if you're if you're fans of the franchise, um, since the acquiring uh, Lucas film. So all of those other Lucasfilm movies have been at least an A-. minus. This one was a B plus. Both fans and critics just not as enthusiastic about this film. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens after this fairly significant opening weekend over the next week when we'll see if fans return to see it a second time or whether people who may be on the bubble maybe decide to stay home and watch The Mandalorian instead. So we'll have to see. Did you watch it? I did. I, I, I went to the premiere. It was, it was really interesting. I love the franchise. I didn't love these films as much as I liked the prior two films in the trilogy. So I thought it was good. It was definitely, you know, worth the trip to the movie theater, but it wasn't as spectacular. I thought The Force Awakens was really sure. a spectacular movie, and this one was just not quite as good. Yeah, my kids wanted to see Jumanji, and we did that instead. And I know, Kara, you didn't see it either. Yeah, I did not. I did not go to see it. And I, you know, my kids did, though, and they did not like it. They, they had the same response to Julia. Um, they thought it was, they, I, 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 they talked about it incessantly, though, and I got an entire download. And, of course, I read all the spoilers because that's what I do, Kara Swisher does. Um, but I think it's interesting. It is an enormous amount of money that it, may, it made. And it, from reading the spoilers, it looked kind of eh, you know, eh kind of thing. And so what's interesting is that the Mandalorian people are loving. Um, and one thing I noticed with my kids, and they're a little bit older than yours, Carl, is they really like Disney Plus, and they were watching The Mandalorian, they were watching movies on Disney Plus, um, and they, even though they went to see this movie, um, they were nonplussed about it, but then they went right off and used a Disney product. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we can think of things in the same way that it's just because it's a big movie opening, that's the big deal. The big deal might be somewhere 
very different and people have more choices. And so I'm not yeah. worried for Disney in terms of that. In that yeah, no, um, I, there's no I, question this is a very profitable product for Disney. It just it yeah. speaks to the changing box office where you just don't have yeah. the same kind of box office power when you're investing so much in the content that you can stream as ho at home. So of all the studios, but, Disney's definitely winning it. They control you know, a third of you, the box office this year. You would agree, though, that the on from here on out, the ongoing role of Lucasfilm within Disney is an interesting question, right? Well, yes. I mean, how much yeah. can you use it uh, without overdoing well, the, the franchise? It'll be three years before they do another theatrical release of a Star Wars movie, but they are investing a lot in Star Wars for the streaming service. They have, you know, two different live-action series in the works, and they also have a bunch of animated series in the works for Disney+, Plus. so uh, kids like, like Kara's kids can continue streaming Star Wars-related content on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, it's a, it's a great franchise. Let's let, let it's been a great franchise, and the, the amount of change it's had in movies, uh, in terms of how we think of movies, is great. It's just people are watching differently. I don't know if I'm going to see it this week. It's interesting when you talked about whether people will go this week. There's a lot of other movies you'd see, and the question is, what do you want to see in the movie theater versus somewhere else? Like I'm thinking Wonder Woman. I absolutely want to see in the movie theater, and I'm excited to see it there. Um, and this one, I'm like, eh, maybe I'll wait for a plane. I can't tell because of, because of the reviews. So we'll see. We'll see. Eh. Okay. Yeah, I did see uh, J.P. Morgan had a list of uh, predictions for 2020, and they thought Wonder Woman mm -hmm. and Top Gun Maverick would be the biggest uh -oh. movers of the Don't summer. Don't even. Carl, so, you I, and I are going to Top Gun even. Maverick. I'm yeah, so okay. excited. I can't even. Oh, wait. I'm even. totally hopping in on this bandwagon. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. I, feel so old, but I don't Kara, care. I've got, I feel the need for speed. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Kara Swisher, thanks as always. <laughs> when we come back, Boeing CEO is out. More on the fallout and the new CEO and the future of the company overall. Plus, he's been calling for Mullenberg's removal since day one. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader is with us. Squaw Galley's back after this. Don't go anywhere. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night, and somehow I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> it was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here, testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use, and the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch tests harder, so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, the Andre Hunter got it! And off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. TuneIn is remembering the biggest college sports moments of the decade, like this one from 2016, when Tennessee quarterback Josh Dobbs throws a Hail Mary to the end zone as time expires against Georgia. Four seconds to go. Dobbs drops back, looks, loads up, fires long for the end zone. The pass is going to be caught by Tennessee. Tennessee wins! Caught it by Tennessee, Jawan Jennings. Jennings makes the catch in the end zone on the Hail Mary. Search college sports on TuneIn to be there for the moments that go down in history. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. That's why I need a one dance. The 2010s was the decade of the surprise album drop. Back to where artists from Beyonce, Drake, and Frank Ocean to Radiohead, U2, and the late David Bowie skipped the traditional promotion cycle to bring their music directly to fans with little to no warning. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. 
Welcome back. European markets closing. Seema Modi joins us now with today's action. Seema? Hey, Julia. So stocks here struggling to build on record highs, even as China announced overnight that it is planning to cut import tariffs on 800 plus products. Take a look at the sectors. Really, the banks in Europe are trading lower at this moment. Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, and ING all down between 1 and 3 percent. One bright spot, though, is the FTSE 100, the UK stock market, trading at a five-month high, driven primarily by a weaker pound. That really has been a story that has played out over the past two weeks. The UK benchmark is now up over 5 percent since the UK general election. But some analysts caution that this will fade as the next Brexit deadline draws closer. That's the end of January. Switching to Boeing, the European supplier is also rallying in this down market, including Senior that produces airframes for the 737 MAX and engine maker Saffron. They make the engine uh, alongside General Electric, but General Electric. But remember, these names are still underperforming amid the turmoil this year. Senior especially down 25% from its February highs on news of the 737 MAX grounding. Finally, as we head toward 2020, no sign of thawing in relations between the U.S. and Russia. Over the weekend, the U.S. ambassador to Germany defending U.S. sanctions against Nord Stream 2. That's the 10 billion euro pipeline that brings natural gas from Russia to Germany through the Baltic Sea. Russia's foreign Minister vowing that they will retaliate. Carl, a lot of lawmakers in D.C. see this pipeline uh, as Germany being held captive by Russia. So, of course, this will be something that we'll have to watch in the new year. Back to you. Uh, huge story in politics uh, and energy, Seema. Thank you. Let's get to Rahel Solomon and get a news update this morning. Hey, Rahel. Here's what's happening at this hour. South Korean and U.S. Special Forces conducting drills. This is as tensions with North Korea ratchet up ahead of a year-end deadline. North Korea is setting the deadline for the U.S. to soften its stance on stall talks. Russian President Putin inaugurating a massive railway bridge to Crimea, which Russia annexed from Ukraine in 2014. He rode a commuter train for the opening of the 12-mile bridge, which is the longest in Europe. A barge carrying 600 gallons of diesel fuel sank in the easternmost island in the Galapagos on Sunday. So this incident occurred as workers were attempting to load a container on the barge with a crane and both somehow tipped. And Sling TV raising the price of its basic packages. The streaming service is adding MSNBC, Fox News and Headline News to its blue-based service. It and Sling Orange are now $30 per month. That's up $5. Subscribers can get both packages for $45 a month. And that is your CNBC News update at this hour. Let's get back to Squawk Alley. Carl, I'll send it over to you. All right, Rahel, thank you. As you know by now, Boeing has fired CEO Dennis Mullenberg for his handling of the 737 MAX crisis, which angered lawmakers, airlines, regulators, and victims' families. Joining us to talk about the leadership change today is Jeff Sonnenfeld from the Yale School of Management, also a CNBC contributor. Uh, Jeff, I've just got to get your thoughts on this. I know it's been something you've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, yeah, thanks, Carl. This is uh, obviously a, a, an unspeakable tragedy, and I'm glad you're going to have uh, Ralph Nader, uh, the, the tragic loss of, of course, of, of his uh, wonderful 24-year-old niece, has very strong and well-informed positions on this. Uh, we've um, probably been expecting that, that Dennis would not be, uh, Dennis Muhlenberg, surviving very much longer as CEO. Many people thought that it would be the return to service in the spring, in, in April. It is unusual to have a, a CEO uh, basically shot at sundown here so that he's removed immediately when there's no uh, uh, gross malfeasance in office, uh, no deception or integrity issue, and, and also to have it in the holiday season and to have it in the middle of an unwinding crisis, usually they'd have somebody kind of steer us through it and then make, make the change unless the person truly was corrupt and there's no, no sign of any such corruption here. Right. So the, the timing's... Well, uh Noteworthy. And also uh, at a point at which we thought the crisis, for lack of a better word, was closer to resolution than its origin, right? Uh, yeah, we thought that we were making good progress. And I, I do think that we saw that the recent announcement from uh, the, the, the director Dixon of the FAA that once again Boeing uh, through, through poor Dennis Muhlenberg, it seemed to get in front of the regulators, which was not a wise move to be uh, you know, telling them what the deadline is. We had a deadline in the late spring that we'd blown past that wasn't going to happen, a deadline in the summer, a deadline in the fall. And then, and then uh, Dennis was pretty sure it was going to be before the end of the year. 
but the FAA didn't see it that way. And and, and Jader, of course, uh, the, 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 the joint authorities uh, uh, technical review board didn't have the, the same view either. So somehow getting in front of those authorities was not great. We have also a, a problem, of course, with, with, uh, of course that, uh, that Morgan has just been reporting on, on, on the ground last week. Amazing she was down there to see this. Uh, the, the loss of credibility, of course, with the uh, with the spacecraft that they they couldn't get it into orbit despite a successful landing and you know launch and landing, is that these things all added up? We saw uh, the the win the the loss of credibility with major air carriers that was hurting us, uh, the hurting the hurting Boeing that is that Southwest uh, Airlines and and Ryan were pretty disappointed that United was making other equipment choices and even American that's been so loyal was starting to get pretty pretty frustrated with this. So these leadership changes I think will be very reassuring to investors, to the flying public, and to the air carriers. Uh, they've got a great bench strength, a great crew coming in right now. Yeah, Jeff, certainly that Starliner was a focus over the weekend as as well. Um, one of the comparisons that was made on this show uh, earlier was to GE. And obviously, very different companies uh, with very different circumstances, but both companies in crisis where a chairman was brought on and then that chairman subsequently became the CEO. Uh, what do you think of David Calhoun? Is he the man to turn this situation around? Well, it's an interesting uh, parallel, interesting analogy, because in both cases, we, we wind up drawing a, a CEO off the board who is all dressed up and ready to take over. Uh, some differences are, though, the board uh, that, uh, that hired the GE CEO that was removed uh, was not the board that fired him. They had a, tra a transition in the board, and yet that new board did sign off on the strategy in July and then removed him in September, so we had only all the indulgence of August to execute the new strategy. That seemed particularly unfair, but it was a winnowing loss of credibility there as well. In this case, David Calhoun, very much like Culp at GE, did not want to undermine the CEO. Uh, Col uh, Calhoun is 62 years old. He's uh, got plenty of, of, of run room left in his career. They have a president there, Greg Smith, who's a decade younger, who's 52, who's beloved. It would be a, a very credible successor, ultimately, to Calhoun. And he's, he's the interim right now until Calhoun unwinds a few things in his professional life and takes charge. But uh, that's a very good uh, pairing. But then they also have uh, Larry Keller, who's a very good uh, former CEO of, of uh, Continental Airlines, as chairman. That person does a great job of, of reassuring uh, the air carriers, so that's that's uh, also quite helpful because the air carriers uh, th are are very discouraged. They've so the, the divide up in a troika way. They've got good opportunities, I think, to draw on the strengths of each. And I, so I think it's a little different from GE, uh, where you had a board change. In this case, it's the same board. Now, uh, obviously, there's a very unique situation here with Boeing, but taking a look at. All of the CEO departures we've seen this year, Challenger Grain Christmas says there was a record 1,480 CEOs that departed just through November 1st. Is there a bigger picture conclusion to draw about the kind of CEO turnover we're seeing and whether CEOs are really being held to a higher standard now? Yeah, in some cases, it's been conduct issues, you know, whether or not it's at Intel or places where there have been people who are widely admired that had dumb attacks and lost their credibility to lead, or some people who, in fact, just had lost their ability to lead, is, uh, is, is for whatever reason, the credibility had run out. And, of course, there were some retirements uh, uh, rolled into that pack, is that this is a, uh, a high watermark of CEO turnover, and it shows us that boards are less likely to... Um, uh, to circle the wagons uh, and, and run cover for a CEO under crisis. The crisis here has, was communications and credibility more than anything else. I don't think we're going to see a major change in technology or, or in strategy or an approach, but we are going to see perhaps a, a very different approach to, uh, to communicating, and the three parties dividing it up will make a difference. But in those other cases, there was some, there was some gross misconduct in, in some of these cases that led to the changes, and that's not the situation here. Piled up, though, wow, what a banner year for CEO transitions. Yeah, it has been crazy, Jeff, absolutely. And the Boeing story is going to be interesting in 2020 as well. Jeff Sonnenfeld. Jeff, thanks. Sure, thanks. As we head to a quick break, getting a check on where the major averages stand at this hour. We've got green arrows across the board after both the S&P and the NASDAQ hit fresh record intraday highs earlier. If all three of these... Indexes hang on to gains. Uh, record closes at the end of the day, so we'll keep watching that. Plus, a new all-time high for Tesla as well, 421. We're watching that in stock. Squawk Alley's back after this.
These days, my eyesight's changing fast. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. Spend Christmas Day listening to the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Featuring five big matchups on the holiday schedule. Unwrap the action starting at 12 Eastern when the Celtics take on the Raptors in Toronto. Followed by the Bucks and the 76ers at 2.30. The holiday cheers continue with the Rockets and Warriors at 5 and the Clippers and Lakers at 8. And a showdown between the Pelicans and Nuggets at 10.30. Tis the season with the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Tech and Focus is the best performing S&P sector of 2019, up over 45% year to date. But as 2020 approaches, should investors expect more room to run for these names? Joining us now with their insights, LJH Advisors Managing Director Larry Haverty and Jeffries Managing Director and Senior Tech Analyst Brent Thill. Larry, let's start with you. My question for you as you look at Facebook and Google in particular, will we start to see a real impact from all of the regulatory questions that have really been in focus this year but haven't started to hit results yet? Well, I think uh, uh, both of the companies uh, have seen uh, the activities of the uh, regulators, Google, on a more piecemeal basis, I think, than uh, than Facebook. They've been uh, periodically making fines or paying fines in various uh, jurisdictions. And uh, I, I think with, with both of the companies, the, the, the regulation is, is more or less a sideshow. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the thing that has propelled these stocks uh, uh, is threefold. One, uh, it's really the, the best way for advertisers to uh, uh, reach consumers and uh, Digital advertising is now over 50 percent, uh, uh, and I, th I think it's probably going to stop somewhere at 65 percent. So that's a powerful thing. The, the, the second is the marginal profitability uh, uh, model. These people aren't paying for content. And uh, when you get high revenue growth, uh, which, which you're getting, and, and basically very little marginal cost, the free cash flow ramifications are very, very compelling. Uh, I think the thing that both of these companies ought to do is uh, is pay a dividend. Uh, I think the uh, pileup of cash uh, is increasingly becoming uh, untenable, uh, and uh, uh, they need to do uh, what Apple did a few years ago and distribute uh, some of it to uh, to the shareholders. But I just uh, uh, think the regulation, I pay attention to it, uh, but it's a sideshow, and I think if you were to break these companies up, the sum of the parts would be worth more than the market's paying for them right now. So I don't view this as a, much of a threat. Brent, do you agree? I mean, Facebook has talked about a deceleration in revenue, but a lot of that is also about this shift to a new business model that's really more about communication, 
Um, you have a lot of questions about whether Google will be breaking out um, more information about its YouTube revenues. Do you think all the regulatory threats are just a sideshow? I do. I've been saying that all year. Facebook's up 57% year to date. At the beginning of the year, no one wanted to buy it because of regulatory. Go back to Microsoft. Did that impact Microsoft? No. Uh, nothing can impact Facebook, Amazon, or Google from a big regulatory perspective. They all have the same risk. So we've been saying the same thing in the entire year. It's going to be the same issue next year. There's going to be headlines uh, of lawsuits and, and issues. But I think you go back to the core. These companies are changing the way that we operate our lives. And we think that they're you know, critical uh, stories that have big moats, that have major competitive advantages that others aren't going to catch them. So uh, we continue to believe that these are still uh, very uh, valuation. Uh, there's valuation support. Uh, some of the software names that we cover uh, are uh, trading the, the stratosphere in terms of multiples. And this is, I think, why Google's up 30% year to date. You know, they implemented a buyback. They're doing more shareholder friendly uh, things. Uh, we, we think, again, uh, that, that the backdrop still looks pretty favorable for large cap internet. And specifically for Amazon, given how Amazon's lagged this year in 2020, we think it can recapture some of the last uh, lost, lost uh, you know, uh, performance relative to the other names that we cover. Larry, Netflix. It's up 25% year to date, but over the last six months, it's down 9.5%. All the competition fears, are they overblown? I think the, uh, the competition's uh, very real. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward, uh, Julia, to the uh, fourth quarter release uh, for two reasons. One, we'll get... Uh, uh, me uh, metrics from uh, Disney Plus, which I think are going to blow people away. And uh, the, uh, the second thing, I'm interested in the amortization on the Irishman. Uh, between release costs and production costs, the Irishman costs $200 million, uh, is my best guess. And uh, I wonder how much of that's going through uh, the income statement. Uh, the other thing that bothers me about uh, Netflix is that the market's been very, very cavalier about uh, valuing foreign subs uh, at the same value as domestic subs. And uh, this is really a myth. The, uh, the revenues are a lot lower. Uh, there's, uh, as new markets are entered, the necessity to uh, uh, construct local content, which doesn't have the scale economy of uh, English content. Uh, so uh, the, the foreign growth, in my opinion here, is a much, much lower quality. And uh, uh, the multiple is still, uh, I think you pay three or four times as much for Netflix to uh, uh, create a dollar's worth of content cash flow as you do for uh, for Disney. So uh, I'm quite cautious about uh, Netflix from here, and I, th I think it uh, the, the odds are pretty high that it continues to underperform, especially if, God forbid, we live long enough to see interest rates go up. If interest rates start going up, all of these companies are going to have problems because the valuation affords no margin of safety for most investors. Brent, do you want to have a final word here on Netflix? Netflix does say that it will start to break out some more granular numbers about those international subscribers. What's your expectation? Yeah, we don't cover Netflix, so I can't really comment. Uh, we, we continue to believe that there is money flowing out of Netflix into the other large cap names from our trading desk, uh, given the overhang of some of the other streaming services, as we talked about Disney+. Plus. So from a trading perspective, we continue to see money flowing uh, into other stories that we cover. Larry, Brent, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. When we come back, he's been calling for the resignation of Boeing CEO since the beginning. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader will join us after a short break. Tomorrow. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Ho, 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 who's 
made a list this year. I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th, 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Hello from the other side. The 2010s saw yet another revolution in the way we listen to music. With music fans giving up CDs and digital downloads for streaming services and internet radio like TuneIn. At the same time, vinyl sales continue to rise to levels not seen since the format's original decline. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bates. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? We've got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams. Starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Welcome back to Squawk Alley. In an open letter to Boeing's, quote, mismanagers, consumer advocate Ralph Nader, who lost his grandniece in one of the 737 MAX crashes, wrote, quote, management was criminally negligent. 346 lives of passengers and crew were lost. You and your team should forfeit your compensation and should resign. Ralph Nader joins us now on the CNBC phone line. Mr. Nader, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, the fact that Dennis Mullenberg has been fired over the weekend and David Calhoun is now poised to uh, take on that chief executive role starting next month, your reaction? There are several important things to say. I think the departure of Mr. Mullenberg was precipitated uh, over a week ago when the new head of the FAA, uh, St- uh, Steve Dixon, uh, basically warned him publicly to stop making rosy predictions about when the 737 MAX was going to be ungrounded and fly again that it wasn't up to Boeing, it was up to the FAA. And that sort of signaled the end of the rubber stamp era by the FAA and that it was going to start reasserting itself. And that sent an unmistakable message to the board. People should realize that the Boeing is in very deep trouble, not just with the 737 MAX. It's, it's continually in trouble with its contracts with NASA, with the Department of Defense. And what needs to happen at Boeing is a change in the board of directors. There's only one person on the board with any aerospace engineering experience. The rest of them are either trophy uh, members of the board or crony members of the board. So what's happening at, at Boeing is a gradual change of executive leadership. The head of the commercial air transport uh, for Boeing uh, left uh, a few weeks ago. The chief engineer left a few weeks ago. Uh, conscientious engineers are quitting, and some of them are protesting or testifying uh, publicly. So I have no idea, Morgan, uh, what these uh, stock analysts are talking about pushing Boeing up today, because uh, the change in leadership shows Boeing is much deeper trouble than that company has uh, been willing to admit. Do you feel that there's another shoe to drop? I mean, I think the, the, the line from the company up at least until the last couple of days had been that Mullenberg should be, you know, the man in the job, uh, or, and also from the analyst community, that Mullenberg should be the person in the job at least until return to surface happens, uh, given the fact that there's so much going on at the company already. The fact that he is no longer in that position, do you feel that there's more to come out? Oh, yeah. There's more to come out, just like uh, your uh, media and others have uh, reported or dug in and uh, exposed over the months. It keeps getting worse. When you look at what the statements were right after the deadly Ethiopian crash that killed 157 innocents, 
Um, the first thing Mullen, Mullenberg did was to say the, the 737 is safe, and he called President Trump and said not to unground it. And at the same time, the head of the FAA, Mr. Elwell, said, uh, parroting Mullenberg, that the 737 MAX was safe. So you can see it's been much more troubling news from Boeing uh, across the board. Uh, Ralph, uh, our colleague Jim Cramer's uh, point this morning is that the company now needs to bring in someone, he suggests ex-military, with a high level of experience in plane safety, to advise and essentially re produce a report that Calhoun can then bless, but that few people are going to believe anything from the company as it exists right now. Would you be satisfied with something like that? No, it's, it's too uh, too little, too late. They need uh, a new board of directors with experienced people in aerospace, NASA, Department of Defense, civilian transport, uh, human factors, engineering, aerodynamic stability. That's what the board is for. For heaven's sake, they're paying each board member over $300,000 a year plus benefits. I mean, you, you know, what are they getting for it? Just someone sitting around the table at board of directors meeting in Chicago, shuffling through briefing books? Uh, Jim Cramer's uh, proposal is too little too late. This is a very troubled company, and it's troubled in the key area of engineering, uh, engineering uh, prudence and engineering uh, perfection. Uh, the the, the uh, whistleblowing engineers... Uh, are showing that it isn't just the design of the 737 MAX, it's the production sloppiness and recklessness at their uh, South Carolina plant uh, with the Dreamliner. John Barnett pointed that out, uh, a heralded quality control inspector for Boeing. And, of course, the testimony by uh, Ed Pearson before the House Transportation Committee last week uh, indicating similar sloppy uh, production um, experience in uh, the Renton, Washington plant. So this is not just a report here. You've got to have a whole, a whole crew of very serious, experienced people who put engineering safety and contractual uh, honesty with the federal government first. Yeah, and certainly you're raising questions that uh, have been swirling around this company and, and for which hopefully, perhaps, we are now on a trajectory to get some better answers. Ralph Nader, Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate You're it. You're very welcome, Morgan. Thank everybody. Well, staying with Boeing, it was a big weekend for Boeing. At 7.58 a.m. Eastern on Sunday morning, Boeing's unmanned Starliner touched down at the Army's White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, a successful ending to a botched mission in which it failed to dock with the International Space Station. So hurtling at 25 times the speed of sound, that's what you can see happening right there, about a mile above Earth in the dark, those three parachutes deployed, a procedure that challenged Boeing in the past, and Starliner became the first American-made human-rated orbital capsule to land on land. Big question now, what happens next? The malfunction on Friday was software-based, specifically a clock error. Still, on a call yesterday, a Boeing official saying once they gather all the data, they expect 85 to 90 percent of test objectives to have been fulfilled. What does this mean for humans getting aboard? We'll expect analysis to take months, then NASA debates whether Starliner needs another test without crew, which given the fixed price contract Boeing would presumably pay for. Meantime, experts say this puts SpaceX, which is also a NASA's commercial crew program, in the lead, depending on its own safety test next month, to become the first to take astronauts from U.S. soil to space in more than eight years. And guys, for better or worse, right or wrong, too soon, uh, more information needed, et cetera. One of the ties, one of the connections that has been made by folks in the aerospace industry over the weekend um, was the fact that this was, again, a software and automation issue. Again, bringing it back to that debate around Boeing and its engineering capabilities. That said, not a failed mission, just failed aspects of the mission. We'll see what kind of data they can collect and how NASA moves forward with this uh, in general now. Yeah, well, we did have, um, Sheila did suggest that it had something to do with the timing of Mullenberg's departure, but uh, that we're going to have to find out more uh, regarding that, maybe from Phil. I'll see you on closing, Bell. Yes, I'll see you. Well, let's get to the judge and the half. All right, Carl, thanks so much. I'm Scott Wapner, front and center, the final push. Sox having a December to remember, and with the new year just around the corner, what happens next? That's what really matters. It is 12 noon, and this is the Halftime Report. The record rally rolls on. 
stocks hit new highs ahead of the holiday with the Nasdaq trying for its ninth straight day of gains. Plus, the new call on Apple. That stock getting a big price target boost. One analyst says the iPhone is on the verge of a super cycle. It's our call of the day. And the future of Boeing. CEO Dennis Mullenberg is out, effective immediately, as the airplane maker struggles to get the 737 MAX back in the air. The investment committee is ready to go. Halftime report starts right now. Welcome. Good to have you with us on this Monday. Our investment committee today, Joe Terranova, Jim Labenthal, Josh Brown, Brenda Vingello's back, the CIO of Sandhill Global Advisors. Let's begin with the market. Stocks extending record gains, the end of year rally continuing. Boy, what a difference a year makes, Joe. Right? Certainly does. Friendly. Remember last December? I certainly do. That stunk. It did. We not <laughs> not we this had, time around. No, not this time around. 30-second well, record close of 2019 on Friday, up 28.5% year-to-date, could have the best yearly performance since 2013. Remarkable. We had a liquidity correction this time last year. We had a Federal Reserve that was clearly hostile. We've seen significant pivots in that regard. The earnings picture really hasn't changed in 2019. We know earnings have basically been flat. It's about multiple expansion. Where we sit right now, looks as though the runway is pretty clear for further price appreciation. We're now getting participation, not just from technology. If you look at the leading sectors for the S&P 500, technology up 47%, obviously significantly outperforming the overall S&P. Communication services up slightly above the S&P, about 30%. Then the rest of the sectors, you got the financials kind of flirting with the S&P return, but the rest of the sectors, they're actually underperforming the S&P. So I think you've got a little bit of a catch up here, some dispersion, which you and I like in multiple sectors, rolls you into January, strong bullish sentiment into January, and then you get earnings. Okay. And can you get earnings growth? And I think that's a critical question so, for 2020. Josh. Hey, Scott, how are you? Good, thanks. Nice you got the memo, you. blue shirt, sweater? Nice. Yes, very comfortable. Rock and roll. Very comfortable today. Um, here's what I want to know. We can love the year we had. It's been a great year, 28.5%. But I really want to focus on what comes next. And there are a number of notes out today that are calling into question whether this whole thing that we've had here is sustainable. Vanguard says we face a 50% odds of correction in 2020. Of course, that means there's a 50% chance you don't have it. But Spoke <laughs> says, says equities, what, do, what do I do with that exactly? I'm not finished, though. Okay. Equities aren't a bargain. Biggest headwind for stock market is valuation. Liz Ann Saunders says investors may be overly complacent about the year ahead. MKM's technical strategy says few signs of market weakness, but the current path is unsustainable. Yeah. So I've been doing this a long time. I can tell you that every one of those statements you could have made in December going into the following year, every year that I've been in this industry. So they're universally applicable. They're not wrong. 50-50% ch chance of a correction? Sure, why not? Actually, history says we'll have an average of uh, a mid-teens correction every uh, year and a half. It's not so, a 50-50 question as to whether the market's too expensive or not. It's a legitimate concern, right? So too, but too expensive compared to what? Because it's not in a vacuum. We, we, we don't, only a Sith deals in absolutes. In the real world, everyone that's allocating a portfolio all over the world is forced to make choices between one asset class or another, forced to make choices between one geography and another. We, we, we don't have the luxury of saying, this is too cheap at this price, it's too expensive at that price. Now, you can have an opinion, and sometimes your opinion will be validated, sometimes it won't, and valuations can go way further than a lot of people uh, expect. Let's but take a look. You, well, can't hold, you on. Say, though, hold on. No. Can't you say, though, that you know, the market's up on, on uh, multiple expansion, lack of real earnings growth? I don't think that's really sustainable. What's, what's fundamental behind Well, the so the question is, should you bet on that happening twice? That's the question. Apple gained $511 billion in market cap this year. It's literally up 82%, biggest stock in the world. Um, should you expect that, that to happen again? No, of course not. Probabilistically, that would be tough. So, look, 
I, I'm one of the people that enjoyed last December. We were buying. It was on the air, talking every day. I'm buying. Here's what I'm buying. Here's why I'm buying. Here's the length of time that I'm looking to hold it for. So it was phenomenal. I hope it happens again. And this idea that we're going to coast with another zero volatility year in, in 2020, I don't think that anyone working on Wall Street really believes that's going to happen. If it does happen, great. If it doesn't, you will get another December 2018-esque opportunity and the question is are you prepared to do something about it and when it comes are you going to say oh this is the dip i've been waiting for but now i actually think we're about to have a crash if if you're going to be guided by your emotions at that moment you won't benefit from it um and if you're going to be rules based and put money to work when it happens you will benefit okay. well, it's really, about, really simple what about this idea brenda of mkm technical strategy right we remain firmly bullish over the longer term we believe the best course of action right here is to take profit. Take profits yeah. in some of these gains that, you, that you've gotten. You know, I, I think we might start seeing that happen, but in the new year. So for a few reasons. One, I think, especially in the fourth quarter, we've had such a strong market, but we had a scenario where so many people were underweight risk assets and equity this year that they're probably still just holding on <laughs> through the end of the year and not wanting to reduce a lot of exposure into that. We also had an environment where interest rates are incredibly low. So money trying to find a home, looking towards the equity market is somewhere where you could actually get more, a little bit more of a return. And then lastly, I think we have the opposite of last year with tax loss uh, selling that really impacted last year. This year, I think